Welcome back to the Demystify Sci podcast. I'm Anastasia. This is Michael Shiloh, and we spend our time exploring the very edges of human knowledge. One of our favorite subjects on the podcast is new interpretations of quantum physics. We have a project called the Material Atomics Channel, where we spend our time trying to put a material spin on the mathematics of quantum. And today we have two members of the Quicyclists who, unbeknownst to us, have been pursuing the exact same project in their group. Very similar anyways, right? So my my own PhD, my background's in material science, which has led me to view all interactions as some components of this vibratory harmonics of elasticity of really just material interactions. So this group is working on a similar conception of reality that comes down to fundamental vibratory interactions. And so we explore that, and it's a very quantitative discussion, but I think we do a good job of trying to ground it in material reality, which is what we're all really interested in explaining at the end of the day in physics. If you enjoy this conversation, make sure to share it with somebody. That's the only way we reach new minds and we're able to really chop this up and get some some energy in the system. Mm. And uh, if you've already done that and you really want to support us, consider joining the Inner Advisory Committee, which is our Patreon group. And you can check that out at patreon.com slash demystify sci. And so a huge thank you to Arnie Ben and John Williamson, who took the time out of their day to tell us everything about the quicyclist theories and the way that they see the world. And it's a first conversation in a much longer series. And so if you enjoy it, make sure that you let us know, make sure that you send us your questions so that we can keep figuring out what exactly is happening at the very, very edges of understanding. Yeah, enjoy. The scientific revolution starts now. Quite a bit of this conversation will be before Arnie's time. He's quite a lot younger than I am. So uh, so, so, I don't know how you feel about that, Arnie, but shall I start with... No, no, that's fine. No, and also the, the other thing, just so you guys know, um, you know, I don't, as I mentioned in the email, I don't have a PhD. I have a bachelor's in chemistry and a master's in music, and I have uh, oh, cool. five or six years of, of you know, non-traditional men- mentorship by John. Mm. So I feel like my education in a particular sliver of physics has 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 gone like really great but i feel like all the other areas there's going to be obviously you know gaps in my knowledge because i didn't come through the traditional physics phd route so just so that um you know just well, wanted to mention that i is going to First show all, you we do a lot of music also <laughs> <laughs> <It's fantastic. laughs> so uh totally understand okay. yeah i i actually tried i worked like you know semi-professionally in music for years before i went to grad school so Oh, really? So I mean, I struggled, but I, I did it. So, but yeah, we, we still love music. I think that's really important. Actually, if you look, going way back, even bef- before, um, is it uh, is it John? Before John's time, I, I feel like all original physicists were also very much concerned with music and uh, the heavenly Absolutely. spheres and all of that. Right. So. And now we're starting to realize why is because harmonic resonance is really the truth of stability in all media and music included. Yeah, yeah, there's something we, to we it. Had a lot of fun. We had a lot of fun listening to Carver, to you guys with Carver Mead as well. And Carver Mead is yeah. one of my favorite people. He's gone such a long way in, in bringing engineering, proper engineering, and stuff you can actually calculate with and do things with. He's gone yeah. so far in doing that. We've gotten close to him since then too. He's he's just a really really kind man, and we had the chance to hang out with him when we, we were just down in LA and we, we got breakfast with him and just oh, just got amazing stories and he's, he gave he's, us uh, he gave us this hilarious list that he printed out on his printer of things that physics cannot explain and it's now hanging front and center in our kitchen for topics well, I hope you've got a copy of that I hope you've got a copy of it now because I, I I want a copy of that and then I'll see what we can't explain and see yeah I think that you might have to update that list after this conversation with John <laughs> <laughs> yeah we'll, we'll share it. It. <laughs> the more the merrier yeah. and, and, and Ar- Ar- Arnie's music is tremendous Arnie's written the symphony and uh, excellent my my brother's a, a, a virtuoso musician as well and his, his 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 house looks like the picture you just showed us of your studio 
and, and 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 he thinks it's brilliant as well. Lani's done some really great work in the, in. in um, well, I want to check it out. Hopefully, maybe do you have public recordings we can link uh, to? Yeah, in the... If you just uh, YouTube, go on YouTube and search for my name, you'll okay. find it's like this two movements. It's the South African Symphony. It's called. So it's two movements for orchestra and three marimbas. Wow, awesome! Uh, it's, it's very cool. It's funny. The last uh, we, the last physicist we had on the show was also a musician too. It's just it seems to be a thing. Um, he was an electronic uh, yeah, musician, but yeah, it's just yeah, music uh, and science. I've always been like you know, it's always been like that. Yeah. By the way, the other thing I also wanted to mention is the way that I came to find John originally was one of the, my fascinations was always the you know the self similarity in nature, and it really troubled me that galaxies and hurricanes look identical. Not just similar, but like the ident- even the fine structure, even the the striations in the clouds match the texture on the inside of the shell. And it like mm. I realized that couldn't be a coincidence. So I started looking into all of that, and um, yeah. So I, I don't know if you. I have a a, a video up on Quasicle about that, the fractal physics of nature and all that stuff. And that kind of led me to look for um, you know the intuition that I came up with was that there there must be this connection between light and subatomic particles. And that's when I went to look if anyone had written on this. And I found John's paper on exactly that. And I was like, wow, this this is the guy. I love it. So mm-hmm. that's that's how we found each other about 10 years ago. Mm-hmm. It is. And that, that connection with light was also one that I came to many, many years before that, because just after I'd finished my undergraduate degree at, in, in mathematical physics at, at Edinburgh University, there were a whole set of things that came up in that degree that were just so exciting. And I couldn't follow them because you had to do your best to get a good degree, good honours degree. So um, af- after that, my father got a, had a job starting down in London and he needed somebody to help him look for accommodation. And I was lucky enough to find accommodation on the very first day for him. So that was out of the road. I had another week down there before we went back up home. We live in Scotland, um, lived in Scotland li- live in Scotland now and lived in Scotland at the time. And uh, we went ahead a free week. And that free week I spent in the library of UC, in UCL Library. The UCL Library used to be, it's been taken over by administrators now, but it used to be a beautiful building with a, with a glass dome on top with light coming in and with these huge oaken desks that you could sit at and lose yourself in and pull stuff out. Mm. And I was convinced at the time that, 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 that there was something missing in, in, well, I knew there was a lot missing in, in terms of people's understanding of elementary particles. So people didn't really know what we didn't really know what they were. We knew that they were, but not what they were, not what they were made of, not why they had the properties that they had. And there had been much conjecture about this, of course, because this wasn't a new problem. People, ever since the discovery of the electron, had been speculating about its nature, and people had come up with vortex models of uh, of of, of um, Thomson's vortex model of the electron was one that was pretty much around at the turn of the century before last. But um, that push towards understanding what was inside those elementary particles had stalled. And it had been stalled pretty much after about 1950, when physics kind of got mired in complexity, in, in the complexity of some mathematics, in my view. And I think that after, after, after electrodynamics, after quantum electrodynamics, I think that, uh, that the people who Feynman, when he developed it, he wasn't happy with it. He wasn't happy with the fact that there were infinities in the theory. He wasn't happy with the fact that one had to conjecture, um, that one had to calculate, had, couldn't calculate such things as the charge and the mass of the electron, but had to use them eventually to renormalize the theory, to act as fixed points which you pulled everything back into. And various people had tried on this, and one, one of the people, one of the lights of this movement was David Bohm. And I sat in the library and pretty much got everything I could on uh, that he'd written, papers and books, everything, and started just simply reading through them. And you can read quite a lot in seven days and get through quite a lot in seven days. And I still have the the um, the, uh, the, the little leaflet for, for the library with all of my little annotations around the side. And it was sitting in that library with the sunlight streaming in that I came to the view that Since the process of electron-positron inhalation led to two photons, and that alternatively one could also photo-excite systems to get get, um, particles, that there must be some connection between those particles and and, 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 and light. And that either either, either the light was being, either either light was a, 
as Carver Mead would uh, would argue, is coming from the particles, or the particles themselves were made of essentially electromagnetic, trapped electromagnetic radiation. So um, it was at that point that I decided to uh, concentrate on looking for a PhD place at CERN. I, was in, I decided I was interested in low energy particles, and I managed to swing myself a place um, at CERN, and um, became very disillusioned at CERN eventually after seven years. This is where it was rotten in the state of Denmark. Mm. The problem was that we, we were the brightest and the best, as it were, from the whole of the world, Russia, United States, Europe, everywhere. People were trying to work at CERN lab laboratories. So we had some extremely smart people there, really wonderful, marvelous people. But these people would find themselves working on things that weren't really physics. They, we, 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 were, we were serving the process. We were serving the machine, as it were, of, of, of this process of trying to find the theory of everything, which is what's supposed to come out of the work at CERN. But um, I hit this at a very lucky time. I hit it in 1979 when the super proton synchrotron first came online. So we suddenly had a microscope that went a factor of 10 deeper into matter than anything had gone before. So, of course, there was a lot of theory about what would happen when we went so much deeper. And the theory proved to be utterly useless, utterly wrong, many orders of magnitude out from what we actually saw. To the extent that um, the leader of our group, when we, we did an experimental test of quantum chronodynamics, the, the main theory of the standard model at the time, and it turned out to be, as I said, four, about four orders of magnitude out in terms of the prediction. So we thought we disproved quantum electrodynamics. However, <laughs> what we didn't know is there was a great deal of consternation in the theory group at CERN that we might not get the kind of thing that they were predicting. And so they had a whole series of scenarios already sketched out, as I've as discovered since. What if it's much bigger? What if it's much smaller? Can we can we do can we move these things around so that we could match the data? And indeed, so we we published we we wrote this paper, and the system at CERN was such that you wrote a preprint, a CERN preprint, which then was circulated at CERN, and then there'd be some discussion, and uh, then we do some internal refereeing of the paper, and then it would be pretty much published wherever we wanted it because um, um, we didn't really need to go through an external review procedure after that. Things would simply be nodded through. Anyway, so out came the paper, off it went, um, so that it was internal to CERN. And a couple of days later, the head of theory um, proposed to come and talk to us about the wonderful new results from the European Muon collaboration. And he came down and he talked to us, and he showed us the picture that we had, uh, the experimental results that we had measured that had disproved, we thought, QCD. And then he said, uh, and then he put superimposed on that a graph saying, oh, and here's the theoretical prediction he said. And it went through all of the points. It was mm. perfect. And we were astonished, to say the least, that this happened, that the, the theory could, both, could, could be so floppy, could be so mm. useless in predicting anything, useless in, in any kind of practical sense whatsoever. And um, the, the head of the group, actually, Peter Norton, he, he, he was almost in tears at this. He was and, and, and he put out a challenge, he said, look, if quantum chromodynamics can do that, how can we tell, as experimental physicists, quantum mechanics from a hole in the ground? Can you, can you elaborate exactly on the, the way that that theory was adjusted in order to make it yes, match this? Yes, I can elaborate exactly, if you like. I mean, there's, there's this fundamental coupling constant in, uh, in strong interaction theory called lambda QCD. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the main effect that had changed everything by such a large amount was a 5%, I think it was 5%, if I remember rightly, change in the strong coupling constant in, in, in this, this uh, lambda QCD. So with a 5% change, you had a four-order of magnitude mo movement in the data. Now, to me, that just says that the theory is, well, the thing is that these theories... Now, looking at it from the Williamson perspective in 2023, and now, now knowing a lot about these theories, what's actually happening is that you are, you are um, working with what's called the non-perturbative theory. 
Now, what it means is you have a bunch of tools in the box as a, as a, as a, as a physicist. You can, you can work with Newton's laws. You can work with equations of motion. They're the best. Or you can go for a, looking for a Lagrangian or a Hamiltonian formalism and look at things in terms of Lagrangian and Hamiltonians. Relativistic. Most, yeah. The most powerful tool we have in the box is the Lagrangian field theory tool, and that's what I'm talking about here. We're talking about quantum... Um, well, we're talking about quantum chromodynamics. Now, quantum electrodynamics can be dealt with with Lagrangian field theory and can give answers that are right to many decimal places. It's a beautiful theory. And there's certainly a very great deal of truth in that. Truth in that, truth in quantum mechanics, truth in relativity, truth in thermodynamics. A lot of physics is really solid. But what isn't solid at all are non-perturbative theories. Because what non-perturbative means is it means that they don't work in perturbation theory. Now, what happens in quantum electrodynamics is in perturbation theory, um, what, what, what you look is you look at the Feynman diagram, the Feynman diagram, for, for example, for scattering of a, of a lepton off a hadron, is the lepton comes in, bounces off, emits a virtual photon, the virtual photon hits the proton or whatever it is that it hits, and you get a slew of particles coming out at CERN. So, um, so uh, that's the microscope that you're using to look at what's going on in these systems. Now, the problem is that when you start calculating a quantum chromodynamic, uh, so in quantum electronics, the coupling constant is, is alpha, is 1 over 137, roughly. It's quite a small number. What it means, it means the first order thing, where you just have a single photon coming down and scattering off a single struck quark, um, gives you most of the answers straight away. And then the next level of perturbation theory, what you have is you have a, a, an extra photon vertex, or you have... Uh, you, you have a, cu a coupling in the Feynman diagram. You don't just have it coming in and one photon coming off. You, for example, have a have a have a have, have a, a photon going from the incoming lepton to the outgoing lepton and coupling that. That's a next order effect. And there are a bunch of diagrams like that, four or five, but they are more than a hundred times smaller in effect. So the, the sum from the second order effects is much smaller than from the first order effects. And the third order effects you can pretty much forget about because they're a factor of 10 to the six down. That's fine for quantum electrodynamics, but quantum chromodynamics, the coupling constant is roughly one, not one over one through seven. And what it means, it means that the first order terms are completely dominated by the second order, and then the third order even bigger, and so on. So you cannot calculate with a non-perturbative theory. And if you can't calculate, you know nothing. Mm. And, the, and that, that, when I realized that, um, well, that put me on the path to leaving, leaving high energy physics because I couldn't sit there wasting my life on stuff that was just not going to go anywhere. And is that, what you, is that what you mean by, you said they weren't doing physics at some point uh, uh, earlier. physics anymore. No, and, and so, what is what, can you just say what, what you think physics is exactly? Well, I think physics... I, 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 okay, I won't say what I think physics is. I think I, I'll say what I think science is, if you'll, if you'll let me go to the bigger... The bigger yeah, we can get back to physics. <laughs> yeah, you know, I think uh, physics is... All of these subjects, and I've taught physics, I've taught engineering, I've taught chemistry, I've taught biology as well at school, um, they all have a big grounding, which is really science and then physics goes off to one part of it physical chemistry is another slice of that chemistry is another slice but really they hold an, an awful lot in common and you might want a chemist if you really want to get into quantum mechanics the chemists are more advanced than the physicists on pure quantum mechanics because they use it mm. a lot and the solid state physicists perhaps even more so so physics is really a very broad church with very many tribes within it who do their own thing but if but what science is is science is the scientific method. Science is that thing that was invented about five hundred years ago, around the time of Leonardo and Brunelleschi, where one didn't look for authority like me or uh, or, or whoever to tell you what was going on. One tested what one thought. One made something up, checked it against reality, and then. The only proof of whether what you're talking about was any good or not was whether or not experiment gave you the answer to that. Mm. But I think what has happened is that the theorists have cottoned on to this. They've realized that any that theories that are that can give exact answers are always subject to experiment. And if you can work in a field where it cannot be destroyed by experiment, 
you're not going to lose that career at the point that the experiment tells you that you're wrong. Mm -hmm. And there's, there've been whole areas grow up and it's become fashionable to have theories that are not testable by experiment and hence not subject to the scientific method. Mm -hmm. And people call this science, but I don't call that science. I call that belief. Mm. It's really more of a religious thing. If you haven't got something which you can test in a, a test against reality, if you haven't got something, as Carver Mead put it, something that you can engineer with, that you can actually do things with, then you haven't got anything. You've got well, something which is a, was a fantasy of yours, and I'm a theorist as well myself nowadays, although I've taught in an engineering department for many years and done much engineering. These are things you just make up. What do you make of the interpretive step of science, though, that goes beyond where you actually have to interpret what an experiment is telling you is happening? I often think about this in context of the geologic sciences, let's say. You can't put, you can't put the Earth into a, a beaker and do something to it. Or a star. Or a star, yeah. And so there has to be some aspect of it that, that isn't experimental. You're absolutely right. That's correct. And there are certain areas where one can do that and should be able to do that. For example, in elementary particle physics, where you can put it into a beaker and test it mm -hmm. to a certain extent. But you're absolutely right. There are other areas where one can't. And I think those areas are still working quite well. So if you're looking at, for example, um, the mystery of gravitational rotation, if you're looking at cosmology, then there are many competing theories as to what might be causing that, whether it's dark matter or whether it's... That's fine. That's good. There's a lively debate about that. One knows that one can't know, and then one's looking to see how the thing fits in with everything that one knows, and I think that's very healthy. Um, and that still is proper science, and one has to interpret as well. One has to say, if science is as it is, as we know it at the moment, then this is a possibility for this, and this mm. fits in. This is then consistent with, it's not inconsistent with um, this, uh, with, with the data as they're seeing. I think actually there's too much, people tend to cotton on to things which are fashionable perhaps a little bit too strongly, and there's a, a movement where people follow the currently fashionable. But, um, I think like the beginning of the universe. Yeah, like the beginning of the universe. I mean, uh, if you look at any creation myth and compare it with the one that we currently think is the most likely, I mean, if you look at the Genesis in the Bible and compare it with, um, so, so God moved upon the surface of the water and said, let there be light. Well, I personally think that's really quite a lot better than in the beginning, there was absolutely nothing. And then suddenly there was this enormous explosion. <laughs> well, I think it's the same thing. I, I think the reason... Uh, it blows me away, actually, that for so many decades, the entire, virtually the entire scientific community accepted the concept of the Big Bang, hook, line, and sinker, despite how many ways it violated the laws of physics. And I think the reason that that happened be was specifically because it's such a satisfying creation story, and people didn't even realize that they were doing that. If you stay within the boundaries of science, that's causality. You know, the beginning of the universe violates causality, so science doesn't have access to that. To, to the create to the beginning to the origination of matter and energy we are locked in essentially to a universe that follows the laws of physics the other thing i wanted to mention um is in a couple of months time i have a science fiction novel coming out huh. oh cool and the reason that i wrote it was part of the reason that i wrote it was actually to promulgate some of the of the work that has been coming out of quasicle hmm, mm. i like that what's the what's the content what's the the subject of it it's the first manned exploration of um, the first exoplanet, Proxima B, around mm. Proxima Centauri. So it's set about 50 years in the future. Um, yeah. Very cool. It's, it's very cool. It's a great book. I've, uh, I've, I've, uh, I have had great fun reading it. I think it's the best science fiction since Asimov. Oh, wow. <laughs> I, I think it brings up a really interesting point, actually, that in order to get to these far star systems, we probably have to understand nature a bit better. Not only just the propulsion mechanisms, but also just how to get along and how to function better as human beings, how to sustain our health on the journey. There's so much uh, understanding that we run the risk of thinking, you know, we've got it. If we've run the risk of trusting theories just because you know, they're popular, 
then we're not going to be able to move things forward. So I think it's directly relevant, actually. You are so right. Yeah. And in fact, Arnie's written another book called The Animal in the Mirror, which deals with how humans view themselves and how humans could perhaps better get along. And some of that's also in the Intrepid mm. book as well. That, yeah, that's the other reason that I wrote it, is to create a story world in which I could put forward these ideas about human evolutionary, you know, instinctive thinking, because all of the dysfunction in our personal lives and in our global, com all of our societal issues arise from the fact that we are essentially biological organisms whose prime directive is our survival instinct and everything we do and think is filtered through that lens. And we're in vehement denial about it because we insist on believing that we are these sophisticated beings that are already choosing freely and, you know, making smart choices. And while we're capable of that, we usually don't do that. Usually we think instinctively. Mm -hmm. And our emotion is simply the barometer of our instinctive, of how we are feeling. Mm -hmm. Hi, kitten. <laughs> yeah, Mingus has come, Mingus has come out. Uh, man, that is so true. I, I just, I'm constantly thinking about um, when I'm lecturing in astronomy about how the ancients saw the stars and they really treated them as these these gods, right? But when you really like peel at what they meant by God, it's really closer to something of the Jungian idea of these sub-personalities, right? Like rage and love and these things that uh, you don't have to be taught, right? You understand them inherently. They're instinctive, as you say. And I don't think people give enough credit to how much of our behavior is driven by these autonomous processes that are just Indeed. sort of unfolding under the surface. Indeed, and in science as well. In fact, in I, would science, argue, yeah. I would argue that science and journalism are the two fields where people are least willing or able to see their own bias, because specifically they believe they are in a field which is about objectivity and fact and truth, mm. and therefore they, they believe that they you know, epitomize those values and therefore they're not willing to see their own bias. And that is one of the most egregious kinds of bias because then you're putting out bias as truth. So this is what quicycles formed to counter. Mm. We are a continuation of the League of Free Thinkers. We 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 do really try to, and we hope you'll do this to us too, to criticize the basis of what we're doing, to get back to where we need to be, which is running the scientific method properly doing this circuit of letting nature tell you what's happening, mm. only letting theories through that are useful to the extent that they're useful, that are practical, that you can engineer with. Theories you can't engineer with are not worth the paper they're written on. You can't do anything with them. They're just being made up. And there's so much made up, and it's become so fragmented. We're getting many worlds theories now. We're getting all sorts of utter nonsense coming out that's pretending to be science mm. and, and and people are quite happy to say things oh yes of course this is not subject to any kind of experiment <laughs> well yeah it's <laughs> much easier that way so yeah, yeah. Uh, take us back to the moment in that office where you are sitting with you know some some superior of the laboratory somebody who's in charge who's showing you how this data now fits right the prediction was four orders of magnitude off now all of a sudden they show up and they have it fit what happens i was i think the youngest person in the room i was kind of a pet i was taken on as a pet because i was so interested in how everything worked and trying to make up these theories of how stuff worked um and it was shock and disbelief, really, because we thought we had a huge result. We thought we had something which really got into saying that was working the scientific method that was that, that was saying, okay, experiment shows that quantum chromodynamics cannot be the theory of how stuff works. That's what we thought. So we're sitting there all smug, thinking, oh yeah, we've done a good job here. And and a heavy job it was too. This involved at, when you're working at CERN, you're working three shifts, so you're working right through the night. The, thing, the, machine, the machine doesn't stop. And this had been, and at this stage, I'd been at it for three years, and 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 we, 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 everything was sweat and tears, really, blood, sweat and tears to do this. And you've got this big result, big experimental result, and it turns out to be nothing. It turns out to be shadows. It was a huge letdown. And, 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 well, I think that, uh, I think fury wouldn't be too strong a word, I think, to put onto this. We were furious. So they had um, adjusted these constants in order to make it map onto it? I just want to make sure I understand exactly what happened. Well, 
Well, it turned out that all of the work that we had done as experimental physicists came down to fine-tuning one of the 50 or so free parameters in quantum chromodynamics, one or two of those that one could take. The thing is that, that the, the theory has a huge number of things which are not understood. And you can pretty much take any quantum. A quantum number is really just expressing this, what you don't know about something. You just say, well, you don't know what it is, but it comes in lumps. Mm. So, so if you take the electron charge, for example, which, if you like, I can explain where that comes from in the, on the context of the new theory that, I, that I've developed. Mm. Um, and that's one of the things we could do. But that was just simply taken as one of the parameters. But there are many. There are all the quarks. There are all the, the, the leptons, different leptons, the different generations. There are all the coupling constants. There are the variations in the coupling constants. So the coupling constants also do what's called run. So it's not the electric charge is always exactly the same. If you hit things together harder, the electric charge appears to be bigger. So, um, and that also happens. And the lambda QCD thing was also uh, related to, to the way that the theory was, 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 was changing as well. So it's not even first order effect. That was simply the number one. <laughs> So each one of these parameters is telling you that some sort of behavioral group, there's groups of behaviors that are happening down there, right? I there's don't think these parameters are sort of telling you much. Hmm. I don't think they're telling you anything because hmm. I think the trouble is there's so many of them. You, you, have a large, you have a large number of parameters, really, then you have a set of things that you can measure to, to, to fix those parameters. Hmm. So I don't, think these I don't think these things are telling you anything. And I think that when they do tell you something, those measurements are now superseded as you go to higher and higher energies. Mm. So even the concept of charge or something like that? Well, the content, the, the, the idea of strong charge, yes, not of charge, not of ordinary charge, but, mm. of, but of, the, of the strong charge, yes, that's been dramatically modified over the last 20 or 30 years. What, what one finds is that as, what, as, close, as one goes to higher and higher energy, what, what was thought at first is that you had the quark model protons up, up, down, simple. So you should see two-thirds, two-thirds, one-third charge on the uh, on the proton. And you should see three quarks. You should see three bits inside the thing. Okay, perhaps held together by gluons or something, by, by something that holds them together. But but you should essentially see three quarks. And the idea was that if you did deep elastic lepton scattering, that what you did is you essentially had a bag with three quarks in it. You hit one of the quarks. So that's what you thought you'd see. What we saw was that, in fact, that it appeared to have hundreds and hundreds of quarks in it when we got to the EMC level. And it's now thousands and thousands of quarks. Hmm. And the valence quarks, so-called, the ones that are supposed to carry the charge, are really down in the sort of 1% uh, of, the, of, the, of the total form moment. Where you have this parameter called X, which tells you what, what, what fraction of the struck hadron struck hadrons momentum is carried by the struck quark as you probe deeper and deeper that number just goes down and down and down so you you less and less as you look harder and harder you less and less see the valence quarks so, do you I think, think that there's like any confusion like all right if these entities we call particles if they are dynamic occurrences in other words if they have some time varying component is it a mistake to treat these events as if they are bodies in motion? Is there some confusion resulting from this? No, I don't think it is. I think that is the case. These are self-creating bodies. The electron, proton, and neutron are things that recreate themselves continuously. That they No, I don't think that's incorrect. But I think what is incorrect is to try and give embodiment to things which one has not been able to isolate. And one hasn't been able to isolate the quarks or the gluons and the properties of the gluons as they're supposed to exist should mean, for example, that they couple to one another. One should get things called glue balls. The but what, what is the self-creating, can you tell me about, can you give me an example of a self-creating body that I'm aware of, like, in my everyday life? Because I just don't, but I mean, I don't play with electrons really, but like something can you like explain to me how a body self creates or, itself? Yeah, yeah, I think that's a better that's a better question. Okay, well, well, uh, bodies composed of protons, neutrons, and electrons, and those those particles are self recreating objects. So if you have an if you have an electron, it's a dynamical object, as you said, it, it is an object, 
and it is dynamical. So it has, in fact, it's highly dynamical. But what it's doing is it's continuously changing. It's a wave, but it's changing in such a way that it doesn't change. So what I mean by that is I mean that if you have a set of parameters which describe that, a set of components of the internal structure of, a, of an electron, then what's happening is those components are continuously transforming amongst one another. But for everything that transforms from A to B, there is something else coming in from C to A to make sure that the properties of the electron are continuously recreated in it's the like dynamic process, which is its internal motion. It's like a flow. You're basically saying that the there's flow. something that comes into it. And so, okay, so that's interesting because the way that I would see that then is a like a standing wave inside of a medium and the medium flows but the wave remains that's right the wave is con the wave is something the wave is not a simple wave and in mm. quantum mechanics already the wave is a complex wave this mm. has two components e to the i k x minus omega t times some normalization content so there you have a complex flow you have something which is in 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 space and in in square in square root of minus one space so that's ordinary quantum mechanics but that too is too simple so this flow is a flow between different kinds of things it's not like a flow of a fluid it's more like in the photon for example you have an electric field creates a magnetic field creates an electric field creates a magnetic field and the whole thing whizzes through space at the speed of light so there your flow is from electric to magnetic back to electric back to magnetic then back to the starting point so, so, so energy is going from electric to magnetic, then to electric, then to magnetic. But in a photon, a photon maybe and usually is many thousands of wavelengths long. Mm. That process is happening over a whole wave. So each element of the wave is being reinforced by the wave by the, by the section coming behind it and is flowing into the thing, and it's pushing forward into space um, because of the nature of the electric and magnetic field. These are essentially light speed objects. So, so this leads us to the question of, is there a physical object down there or is it not um, physical? What do you mean by a physical object? Do you mean like, like a little hard ball? No. Can I take this? Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I guess the distinction is bodies that ha bodies are defined by their surfaces, right? They have an inside and an outside. They have something which resists interaction with other bodies. Like the surface is the boundary, right? And so the question is, are there bot, like you're talking about dynamic occurrences, like a field is a dynamic occurrence as well. So it must be telling us about the motion of something that is moving. And the it question is. is, what are those things? What are those fibers that are moving? Do you have any sense of that? A sense of it? I have a whole theory about it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, okay, so I think that this is, this is a, big question that we spend a lot of time talking about on the podcast because this is a huge cleavage point between the the generic let's say consensus physics and the people that are working on the other side which is that quantum field theory you get to the bottom of it and it's a bunch of measurements and that's where it stops the measurement is fundamental would you say that there's something beneath the measurement well, yes, there is. There's, there's, there's the nature of reality. But of course, the three worlds are proper. There is the world of whatever is, and that thing is one cannot fully know because one's a part of it to begin with. Then there's the world which one lives in, which is what you make up in here, and we all make up different worlds in which we live. Mm. And there is some consensus between people about what that world, the properties of that world might be, and we call that consensus science, and a lot of it is very, very solid. But the, 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 the sciences, which were mostly developed before 1950, uh, quantum natural dynamics is the exception, that one actually makes things with, that makes progress with, that makes cars go, that makes computers work, that does mobile phone stuff, that stuff is not the quantum field theories and the string theories and so forth. It is Newton's laws, mostly, and then quite a lot of Maxwell and uh, quantum mechanics, yes, in terms of lasers. But, um, and in terms of understanding what's happening at the depths of the solid state and in terms of collective excitation, such as magnetism and superconductivity. But yes, there is something real down there. Mm. But the world one lives in isn't the world of hitting hard things or feeling, feeling solid. You feel solid objects, you see solid objects, and they're solid at the, 
scales which we operate at, at about a meter or so in size. But looked at very, very closely, what you're, what you're living in is you're living in a world of interactions. You don't live in the world of, of, of things. You live in the world of your interactions with things. What, what does this do to me? What, how is this relating to me? And things relate to you, for example, in a universe which looks very three-dimensional. And you know what? It is three-dimensional. The world you're sitting on at the moment, there's two very comfy looking chairs, is a three-dimensional world because the thing that's stopping you from falling through it and the thing you feel on the chair is the electric field, really on the ex exter exterior of that, of that object. And that's three-dimensional and always has been. It only has three components. It doesn't have four components. And in fact, it turns out that the, that the universe is more complicated than being merely 4D. It is really properly a set of spaces, three-dimensional spaces, which have a, fourth, a set of four other objects, which, um, which are all part of a single flow of an underlying stuff, which I might call... In other words, what the new theory does, what, what, what quantum bicycle, what, what the theory that Martin and I developed does, is it takes a single kind of stuff, a single element, and posits that that element, in terms of the way that it moves dynamically, creates light, creates matter, correct, creates quarks, mm. creates the basis for the standard model, creates uh, electrons, creates charge, creates mass creates everything on the basis of a single kind of well there's not a good english word for this stuff substance <laughs> root energy stuff, stuff. Um, stuff. I, call it, I like it i, I call it we, we we call it i call it ur stuff because when we were developing this theory martin it was mostly in dutch mm. so um so uh, i'd learned dutch when i was in holland and uh, and my dutch was better than martin's english so we used to usually use dutch um, and there's, there are wonderful, Dutch is marvellous because the Big Bang in, in Dutch is called the Urknal. Ur meaning the original and knal meaning bang. Mm. Mm. <laughs> so, so I call this stuff Ur stuff because of, for the same reason. It's, there's not a good word for it. You're right, we're, we're struggling in English. We've got substance, we've got stuff. I mean, stuff looks, sounds like dust, doesn't it? It's the stuff you get in your vacuum cleaner. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love that, actually. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me that you would be trying to pin everything back to some substance that's doing whatever it is that it's doing. And I guess these extra dimensions, it's it's maybe, if I can unpack that a little bit, it seems you mean like... like the, the Ford, the Ford? It seems like once you start adding ones, you're talking about the interactions at that point. You mentioned interactions, and I feel like you're talking about different levels of interaction. And so... I am. I did, am. You guys, did you guys have a chance to watch the talk that I gave on Saturday? No, we didn't. I'm sorry. That's no. Then that's fine. The reason that I ask is because, um, in terms of the stuff that we've been developing in Quasicle and the stuff that that John's been focusing on, it kind of gave a nice outline in the following way. The first question was, what is the substructure of the electron, which goes into that subquantum realm? Then, what is the origin of the monopole charge? <clears throat> then we unpacked specifically what are the components of the electron's quantum spin and there are three specific components that we spoke about and then the talk went on to show how those things mediate things like electron bonding and Pauli's exclusion and Hun's second rule etc cetera, etc cetera. but the towards the end we delved into just a little bit of an overview of John's math and the one of the papers that John and I recently worked on is breaking up these 16 components of root energy into these sets of three spaces. And when John says, for example, that electric field is three-dimensional, um, it, it's really talking about a, a, it's a dx by dt or a dy by dt or a dz by dt. So it's kind of three-dimensional, but each of those is a derivative combination. So it's really, it's the interaction, it's the transformation that determines the the reality, not just the, the x, y, z, and t. And what's interesting about that to me is that magnetic field, so electric field is a bivector. It uses one time dimension, one space dimension, dx by dt. Whereas magnetic field is also a bivector, but it uses two spatial components. It's dx by dy, which is a plane, a twist without a, but it's not a rotation because it doesn't have a time component, which is a fascinating idea. It's almost like a, a twist bias that's being, in, you know, that's being inflicted on the, sp the local space time by the presence of that magnetic energy. And then spin is also interesting because it's a trivector. It's, it involves one 
dimension of time and two dimensions of space. So it's three dimensional, but only, but each one uses a different three of the four, if you know what I'm saying. So spin would be like a d by dx of a dy by dt, or a d by dy of a dz by dt, and then a dz by you know dy d by dy of a dz by dt. It's the three permutations. So it's three dimensional, but none of them use all four components of four dimensional space time. If you know what I mean, which is yeah, it's just like not it's not a homogeneous motion in one particular axis essentially is what you're saying and each property is defined by a different set of motions and a different transformation in the math exactly it's but, so the one, but what they all have in common is that they're all really root energy at the level of field so all of them have to be squared to get an energy density including the things like root i mean it's hard to even talk about in these terms but there's like a root mass term the same way that electric and magnetic have a field mass well, is a that's ordinary quantum mechanics, because if you think about the probability density, it's psi star psi. It's a square term that you have. The wave function is a square root type of thing. And, and it is the same case for electromagnetism. E, the energy density of the electric field is a half epsilon E squared in uh, in uh, in SI units, and in the magnetic field is half epsilon C squared B squared. Mm. So, um, so the, they're all square root quantities. And the thing is that what you're getting is, although I'm saying it's not merely four-dimensional, everything is based on the four dimensions of space and time. So by putting them in different combinations, by dividing one by the other, what does it mean to divide space by time? What does it mean to divide something like this by by by, by one of these? I mean, what were you doing when you're dividing space by time? We know what it is. dx by dt is a velocity. In the X direction, right? I mean, I guess that's what you're doing is you're looking at individual components of that motion. Well, you're, cre you're creating a movie. Is, is, isn't that well, what you're, you're doing? Creating, you're creating, creating frames You're like talking about movie. the X motion in the movie, the Y motion in the movie, like they're different aspects. Yeah, yeah, definitely. But I mean, I think that when you're, when you're dividing space by, when you're, when you're looking at space across time, all that you're doing is you're, is you're tracking the change of events over that time because... One event has time already in it. But yeah. Once you get into these higher level abstractions, you're, you're talking about... You imagine it being like a movie where you have a 3D movie where things kind of move along, click, click, click. But time's actually more complicated than that because you don't really live in time. You really live in inverse time. Hmm. Explain that. Okay. The thing is that you have to... Or you really exist. The thing is, energy is Planck's constant times of frequency. And frequency is an inverse time. And that's quantized. So the thing where you have substance is actually not time, but inverse time. Inverse time is something which one can chain. Time is time has extent, and space has extent, uh, but inverse time has frequency, and inverse space has spatial frequency. Just just as happens in the solid state. So you, you as a solid state physicist, we're used to thinking about k space, about inverse spaces. Uh, about crystal space as well as the space in which things ha have some existence. So, but if you think about what actually has substance, what has existence, it's not in time, it's in inverse time, it's in frequency. In fact, there's some sense in which frequency is energy, E is H nu at the quantum level. Isn't that so, just telling us that something like energy can only be described in terms of a change? Like there has to be some sort of motion, essentially. And so if, if it's an inverse, you're just saying how much change has occurred per time, essentially. Well, isn't time similar? Because you can only measure time in terms of, we only measure time in terms of things that have a frequency. Mm -hmm. So if there is no energy, does time even exist? Meaning, well, and is and what's more fundamental, space, time, or energy? It's an interesting question that John and I sometimes talk about. Mm. Uh, do do they have to be? Does one have to be more fundamental than the other? No, they both have to. No, and that's the thing is, you have to have both. The universe we live in has both, but we don't normally tend to think of them as a separate set of four dimensions: space, inverse space, time, inverse time. But if we're doing the things which matter, which there is some underlying framework which is difficult to know because all that we live in, all that we are, all that we see, all that we feel is in the dynamics. It's mm -hmm. in things that are like dx by dt, that are like vibrations. So, so the question is, of course, a vibration in what? And then you right. say, well, it's in space-time. But is it in space-time or is it in the inverse space-time? Or is the vibration, what is the vibration? The vibration is the stuff that we're talking, the or stuff we were talking about. It's in the dynamics. So there's this underlying existence, which is whatever it is, 
But what we do is we live on the surface of that as a set of perturbations, as a set of vibrations, of mo- motions in that thing, whatever it is, underlying thing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Does, so, the, um, does the underlying thing have a geometry? Certainly, four-dimensional. And the reason it has that four-dimensional geometry is very, very beautiful. Do you... Uh, I want to know more about the reason for it, but what is... Do you have a... Is it a... Is it a shape? Like, can you can you describe the shape? Does it have of- a structure? Yes, it is. It but, a shape. but a structure is a static concept, right? Like a no, skyscraper no, no, no. has a structure, but we it wouldn't we wouldn't have to ascribe a time dimension to a skyscraper to understand no, it. You right? wouldn't. And you're quite right, and and that's a very good question and a very very good discussion. Um, the thing is that you don't have to ascribe a shape to it, but the question is in which in which combination of dimensions does the skyscraper exist and where it exists it exists in has an existence it has an energy in a frequency space but then it has an interaction which is in an electric field space the things that are keeping the atoms in place in the structure of the skyscraper are interatomic forces which are mostly they're not wholly but they're mostly electric field and also partly spin forces so one needs to go into spin space to understand something of the interaction of these things. But the most of the interaction comes from the three-dimensionality of the electric field, <laughs> d vector potential, d vector, d a. Well, calling the vector potential a, and a x being the vector potential in the a direction. The electric field is d a, d a by d a x by d t, d a y by d t plus d a z by d t, or in any other conformal orthonormal coordinate system, of course. They're dynamical spaces, and the dynamical spaces are interacting with one another in a matrix. But that matrix, those things are separated by space, which is not inverse space, but which is real space. So you have a vibration of these things, but they overlap in both the spaces. But they both overlap because they're adjacent to one another. That little grain of quartz in that concrete has has quartz that have have, have um, silicon and uh, oxygen atoms close to one another. They're, they're overlapping in real space. But in vibration space, they're not just overlapping. And this is what Arnie's been doing a lot of work on recently as well. But they are merging with one another. Mm. That thing is not a, an object which is separate. And I've heard you guys talking about this too, and I completely agree with you. You're talking about something which is a resonance, which is which is something which is flowing across the system and through the system, which is forming the chemical bond between this those two objects, that's also a vibration, it's also a frequency, it's also an energy. It's a reduction in energy in this case, a negative energy that binds them together. So, but it's a very, very beautiful connection. And the reason it's so beautiful is because of the commensurability between three space and four space. If you look at the fundamental interactions in four space, you find that they really match precisely onto a three space. And there's no other pair of spaces that are that close in dimension that do that. Seven-dimensional space has a relationship to four-dimensional space, but it's two dimensions further up. So it's only the four and the three that give you this very, very beautiful commensurability between what things look like when you do simple things like rotate them. It's like God is playing a computer game. And he's saying, well, what could we, how many... Dimensions do we need that a rotation makes sense in both this thing, electric field, and in magnetic field, and in spin, and in space, where all these things fit together seamlessly, and they do between three space and four space. And that's the why of four space, in my view. When you say, uh, when you say three space versus four space, you're just talking about three dimensions versus four dimensions? Yes. I see. Well, I'm, talk- I'm talking about... No, I'm talking about... Three dimensions that we thought we lived in up until quantum, uh, up until relativity. That that is the simple three dimensional space of um, of x, y, and z, mm. where the metric of that x, y, z is plus plus plus. They all square to square square to plus one. X dot x is plus one. I guess my question is fundamentally: if this, I forget the Dutch word. I'm sorry, but like First the. Space. What is it? Or space. Or space. Oh, no, or stuff. Sorry. Or, or stuff, stuff, yeah. The, yeah. The, the substance at the base of all of this motion and interrelationships of motion and patterns of motion, 
The substance within its own context, like myself with relation to the skyscraper, I don't have to concern myself with the dynamic nature of the skyscraper in order to know that I can push on it and it's not going to go anywhere. Yes, you don't. Because and so is there a structure that you can conceive of? Do you have insight into the structure of the Ur stuff in that static context with respect prior to its motion? No. Fair enough. That also is formless. It is given form by its interaction. So, so the form of the skyscraper comes from the interaction between elements of the skyscraper, and that gives form. Mm. But the stuff itself can travel freely between different and does travel freely quantum mechanically. So, you have a couple of electrons in 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 a shell of a helium atom. They're mixing. They are flowing through one another in a very beautiful state, which we call a dielectron state. So um, you really have something which is not an electron. It's really a pair of electrons which have sunk into a lower energy because there's a, there's a, there's a symmetry in the motion of those electrons. But the before, before the motion, right, so the, yeah. these particles of the uber stuff, those must have some structure with respect to one another in order to interact. Do you, do you, would you agree with that? No. No, I don't think they have to have a structure. I think things have to have a structure in order to interact. But the stuff that's interacting is playing a beautiful dance inside things that already exist, mostly. Although we do have a view about how things come into existence as well. So, so what you have is something which is more like a, a perfect fluid. So if you, if you can say a perfect fluid has a structure, then yes. So this thing has no more structure than, for example, an electric field has a structure. Well, a fluid I must have a structure. It wouldn't be able to move, right? Like without subunits, they wouldn't be able to... There has to be a void in order for the pieces to slip past one another. No, one talks about the electromagnetic fluid. So, uh, so if we're talking about light, there, there aren't pieces to light. It is a, it's electric and magnetic field. Well, it's an event, right? Well, okay, so hold on, hold on. Yes, it is an event. There does need structure, and that's correct. Sorry. And I think that the, 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 so I, f I feel like it deserves to be put on the table that we have a separate project where we work on material interpretations of the equations of quantum mechanics. And that's probably, you heard us talking about it when you listened to the Carver Mead conversation. And the, this, this is not a, a pure unbiased line of questioning because we're trying to understand where the, the division between the way that you see the world is and the way that we see the world. Where one of the things that we've been pre occupied with is, okay, so if the electron is a resonant structure of some sort of substance. electrical fluid field oh, good, substance, yeah. the the yeah. or stuff, then yeah. the or st because Shiloh's PhD is in material physics and he spent a lot of time thinking about resonance and material properties and elasticity, he comes at it from the perspective of, okay, in order for it to bend and flex and flow and behave from a material perspective, there must be substructure. And so one of the questions that we're asking about is, what is the possible substructure? Because coming at it from first principles, the way that things flow, flow requires axiomatically substructure, because otherwise you can't get shape change. You have to have an actor in order to act, something like that. <laughs> You are so right, and and uh, and I, I apologize for going no, no, no before, but it was the question as well. <laughs> uh, let, me, let me try and answer this. The thing is that one does need not just an actor, but one needs a, both both a source and a sink of thing. One needs bookends to the thing. One needs to have both a beginning and an end. And those things have structure and have substance, and they're such things as elementary particles. Now, they have structure, but the, but the energy inside them is something which gains its structure from the way that it interacts with the rest of the universe around it. Got it, got it, got it. Yeah, and <laughs> photons would make sense to fall into that bin to some extent. This is like the separation between bodies and events, in my mind. Exactly, exactly. Now, that's a beautiful... Now, also, Carver Mead has a beautiful view of this. He's, he's a, I think, a quite singular view as well, to be fair. And I love his beautiful book on... on, 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 on uh, it's a beautiful green book mm. on uh, collective electrodynamics. It's a beautiful way to show how far you can get without looking at fields at all. 
Mm-hmm. With just looking with just looking at the with just looking at the particles and just looking at the sources, and I think it's utterly fantastic and it's a magnificent intellectual thing. But I think he's completely wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you think he's completely wrong? That's fascinating. I think he's I think he's completely wrong because I think you need both. Mm-hmm. I think I think this, this conversation has been had. Most physicists have have believed for most of their their lives. That is the fields that are real things that can be measured, and the vector potential is the thing that one can't know, and one can't know it because it's a gauge theory, and you have this possibility of adding a scalar gauge to anything, and you still get the same fields because when you do the derivatives to get the interaction, any any scalar thing falls out. So most people believe that the scalar potential is the imaginary thing, and the field is the real thing. Now, Carver Mead is not phased by the fact that everybody else believes something else has gone in completely the other way around. And he's completely right, because you can't have an electric field without an electron, without a charged particle. You can't have the field without a source and a sink. So um, are there are other people. Uh, Cracklauer also uh, has this view. And you've got to just respect these guys for this view, because you can get so far with it. But then you come to something like the photon, and the photon has this more formless thing where it doesn't have hard bits in it. It has fields. It has hard bits at the interaction, at the point where it's created and where it's destroyed, that are very hard, that are very solid. But then what happens in between that is, 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 is uh, well, follows all possible paths in space, is, 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 is the current thought. And these interfere constructively. And if you, do a, if, you, if you look at quantum electrodynamics and start having a look at the, uh, uh, the path integral for these things, you find that the thing pretty much goes along a straight line. All beautiful, beautiful maths, fantastic maths. And all probably quite with, with a very great deal of truth in them. But I think that this is a sterile argument. I think that the, the thing is, in, in, in my theory, you have a derivative, four derivative, a space-time derivative, which acts over all of the possible combinations of space and time. So time, space, 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 time, space, time, space, time, space, T, X, T, Y, T, Z. X, Y, Y, Z, Z, X, and so on. These are all linear, linearly independent of one another, and can each one can carry a component of root energy. So you have all of these things interacting with one another, and they're all coupled by a set of linear differential equations. Now, what that means is it means that you can either do everything in the even space, and that's fields, or in the odd space, and that's the vector potential, and they both have to agree they both have to agree. It has to work in both, and both are equally valid, but it's not one and the other, it's one or the other. If you, because everything is in the even space half of the time, and in the odd space the other half of the time. So what you're doing is you're looking at the dynamics of a system which is going odd, even, odd, even, odd, even, or if you look at the second differential, it's going even, 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 or odd, odd, odd. So if you look at the level of a, of a wave equation, then one can look at either or, either even or odd. But if you look at the level of the Dirac equation, the linear equation, or the Maxwell's equations, then you get both. You have to have both. And that's why I think Carver Mead's wrong. I don't think he's wrong. I think he's completely right as far as it goes. But I, I think it's a sterile argument to say that the one is fundamental and the other one isn't, because I think... Um, but I think that if I was to have that argument with... If we were to gather all physicists together in a room, the, us guys and everyone else, I think I'd be on the side of Carver Mead. If I had to choose between even and odd, I'd go for the, I'd go for the, um, I'd go for the, I'd go for the view that you had that bookends are more important than the floppy bits in the middle. It sounds like when you're saying even and odd space, what you're talking about is you're just talking about two different ways of looking at the same event. Same thing. Yes, and you're right. You're, uh, I should also say that both of you talking about events is something that I'm very, very happy with. So if we have something which is an interaction between an actor and an acted upon, then I think that, that really one has... If we talk about the emission of a photon, then we're talking about just, as Carver Mead said, if we're talking to relative, relativists, to relativistic people, well, in that case, the light is traveling at light speed, and that means that the interval between emission and absorption is exactly nothing at all. The two things are on the light code and hence are at the same point in space-time, emitter and absorber, always. 
Um, which is which speaks right to your guys's point about having the two atom universe mm. so they they literally touching from the photon's point of view well they ha- oh, okay so that's 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 an interesting place to go so um one of the things that we've talked about before is the significance of the radial distribution function of the electron extending to infinity yes what is what does that mean to you um, I could show you a diagram, but you can't look at it at the moment. <laughs> the thing is that w- what one has in a transaction is one has a space and an inverse space. Why do you need a space and inverse space for a transaction? Because objects are quite complex. If you have an electron, it's an object which exists in 16 components in a multi-dimensional and a four-dimensional space extended over all the possibilities of divisions within that space. And there are 16 possible components there. So it's a quite a complex object. Now, what you want to do is deliver a packet of energy from emitter to absorber. And the way to get something from a complex distribution to a packet of energy is to find its inverse. Anything times its inverse is just going to be the scalar number one. It's going to be one unit of energy that gets transferred over. So what you have to do to take a spherical distribution from an emitter and look at a spherical distribution on a possible absorber, is find out what that inverse transformation is. Now, a long time ago, there used to be a bunch of physicists who didn't have computers. Those physicists still had to do calculations and calculate stuff. And they they had some quite good names, people like Maxwell, for example, or Hamilton, people like that. These guys didn't have any computers. I see your computer, it's a beautiful (laughs) (laughs) thing. And in those days, they had to find ways of doing calculations without having computers. And they found a very, very powerful series of ways of doing that called um, conformal transformations. Now, one of the simplest conformal transformations is the inverse transformation. So what you have is you take a distribution, a spherical distribution, and you invert it. How do you invert it? You take a unit sphere somewhere else, and you look at all the lines coming out of that to your unit sphere, and you draw them. And what you do is uh, you look at the length, and if the length is three, then uh, you draw a point somewhere on the circle of a third of the other one, and um, in the same direction. And if you do that, you find your utter astonishment that what you need to invert a spherical distribution is a bi. What you need to invert a circular distribution, because we're talking about something two-dimensional, if you have a an axis between emitter and absorber, then perpendicular to that is where all the action happens. So if that's light speed, really emitter and absorber at the same point in space-time relativistically. So what you're really having is you're having an interaction between one, circulation one, which is transferred to circulation in the other. Vibration, energy, frequency is being transferred. So frequency vanishes off one and it appears on the other, just like Carver Mead was talking about and and, and Feynman and Wheeler talked about um, in... Uh, in, in, in their beautiful paper um, in uh, the early 50s. So you have to have that transfer of energy. Um, and that transfer of energy, energy is a scalar quantity. You need an inverse. And what the inverse is of a circle is it's a bicircle. It's another circle where um, one of the circles corresponds to things inside the unit circle, the other corresponds to the universe outside the unit circle. So what you have in a transaction is you always have co and contravariant in standard relativistic theory to get some quantity, some scalar quantity. But that generalizes in in my theory to a thing and its inverse. But the inverse of a sphere is, well, the inverse of a sphere is a torus. Mm. And we have a toroidal system, which is the absorbing system. And that this is in, this is in, this is in, 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 in 3D, but um, going to 4D, um, one has the same thing. One has one 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 has the uh, the projections of that, the, those um, to 2D, which is what we're talking about here, is of a uh, hypersphere is either a sphere or a torus. So spheres can be the inverses of toruses, and toruses can be the inverses of spheres. And these are things that are possible interactors then. But look, if you think about a photon being emitted from, let's choose a star 10 light, Vega, 10 light years away, coming to your eye, what is the chance that 
that photon being emitted from Vega forward in time happened to find your eye at exactly that place in time where you happened to be looking at it on that nice starry night last night. It's pretty damn small if you work out the cross-section for it going in that particular direction, not in any other direction. However, if one's talking about inverses, then the inverse of a very, very small thing is a very, very large thing. And one needs to factor that into the probability as well. So, well, I mean, I think that, that that's 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 radial distribution, right? Because if you have a point, like if we can model Vega as a point, and you're like, well, what are the odds that it comes to you? Well, it's radiating outwards radially, which means that it's the 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 distribution of its radiation is massive relative to the originating point of the rays. Exactly. Yes, it is. So, 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 so it is absolutely massive. But that particular photon did go from Vega to your eye. We have to go looking so for it too. <laughs> you, I mean, you you're not going to just yeah, you see it you if you're not if looking. Not looking, you would have seen it, right? It would have gone. We probably need a pretty nice telescope. Yeah. Yeah. Well, but the thing is that that particular photon, for that particular photon, relativistically, your eye was on Vega, and Vega was in your eye. Mm -hmm. The two things are connected by a zero interval. Well, there's a lot of stuff in the way too, right? There must be a fair amount of relay going on as well. Yeah, you, you're absolutely right. I mean, the thing could perhaps connect with some piece of dust uh, three light years out, and then go down to a, a sort of scattering off a reflector. Yes, but but that path, whatever that path was, through all of those interacting media from A to B, is an interaction which is inviolate. It's light speed. It happens at the same place in space time over all of those interactions. Mm. If it's just scattered, if it's absorbed and re-emitted, that's a different matter, of course. Hey, have you thought much about cosmological redshift in context of this? Look, um, yes, but remember that's not my expertise. Arnie's thought, uh, Arnie, I'll, I'll pass that one over well, to you. Um, well, also, one of our other bicyclists, Viv Robinson, has worked extensively on this, and he's got some really remarkable theories, but... Um, this is one of the other things that I wanted to say earlier about the concept of the Big Bang. It rests essentially on two pillars. One is redshift and one is the CMBR. And if either one of those things could be explained differently, the Big Bang theory falls apart. So to my personal feeling on the redshift thing, based on what I've learned from Viv, um, is that whereas a Doppler effect is a, is a perceived effect, that people believe photons don't actually lose any energy when they traverse space-time. Uh, I believe that that's not possible because there isn't an infinite amount of energy available to keep the universe expanding in an accelerating fashion. Um, I believe that, red, first of all, there's two kinds of redshift cosmologically that Viv describes. The first one is as the photon is leaving the star, it's climbing the gravity well of the star, which means that it's losing energy, but it can't lose velocity so therefore, it has to lose that energy from its frequency, which will increase its wavelength. And that's really a, a gravitational redshift as it leaves. But as it's traversing the vast distances of space, um, Verve contends that space has a viscosity and that photon is going to lose tiniest amounts of momentum as it travels. And which means that it'll, it's, an, it's not a perceived Doppler redshift. It's an actual redshift from energy losing, from photons losing energy along the way. And this brings up another interesting point is that why we can only see 13.8 billion light years. It's not because that's all that exists. It's because photons are redshifted into oblivion after that amount of distance. So it really it's just the limits of our perception in a universe where we're using photons to look through something with a refractive index, essentially. Mm. Uh, Arnie, do you have an idea of why most people, most professional astrophysicists are convinced that tired light theories are a waste of time? Do they? Uh, everybody I talk to says that these the tired light decisive. theories have been defeated numerically time and time again. Is what you're proposing fundamentally different from these defeats? Um, it's a good question. I'm not sure. To tell you the truth, that would be a question I, I think, for Viv. I think it's. I think it's. It's. It's quite. It's quite amusing. Um, uh, I, I was giving a talk at one stage on my theory, and somebody asked the same kind of question you just asked, completely mm. left field. Of me. So, what does your theory say about the Big Bang? <laughs> and um, so, so, uh, so, uh, so. Um, so Inquiring minds want to know. Well, I'm just curious because uh, nobody has explained nobody has explained the defeat of tired light to me ever, and it seems it makes a lot more sense to me than you know things. Me neither. 
There's another, there's another chap in our group, a guy called Lyndon Ashmore, who's been publishing some papers on some stuff related to this as well, which is really tight light as well. And no, no, people have not explained to me satisfactorily why it's not no good. But what I, what I did at this talk is I said, well, as everybody knows, the Big Bang has been, produ- has been proven wrong, I said. Uh, uh, so, and then I said, and here's why. And I wrote down several things on the board, uh, amongst others. You, you're familiar with Halton Arp's stuff, with the... Uh, with that, with Arp stuff, the Atlas you know, of so Unusual Galaxies, that. yeah, yeah, that's that's so cool. And and, and the poor man, he's, he's for all his life, he's trying to push this, and people are just not believing him. But it's just obvious, anyway. But nonetheless, anyway, th- th- there was that stuff. And the other thing that I said is, look, if you look at the nearby, back in the time when the Big Bang theory was developed, uh, you couldn't see this. But nowadays, you can have a look at individual stars within Andromeda, for example. Andromeda is moving towards us, it's blue shifted. But if you look at the individual big stars, they're moving, they're not gravitationally bound. If you, if you, if you say that their red or blue shift is due to a Doppler shift, they're traveling far too fast to, be, to, to remain bound, which means that your hypothesis for why, why it's red, the Big Bang's hypothesis, for where the red shift comes from, is proven false by the fact that that could only be the case in Andromeda if. 10,000 years ago, all these heavy, big stars were outside Andromeda moving in. They all happen to be in Andromeda just now, and in 10,000 years hence, they'll all be outside it, which they're not. So that means that the red and blue shift we observe for those stars is not caused by a Doppler shift. It's caused by something else. Mm. So, and what was amusing about the thing was I was giving a talk to a bunch of, well, um, astrophysicists, uh, amongst others, half the half the audience was astro were astrophysicists. And what was remarkable about it is a lot of certainly the younger people came down and said, "I am so glad you said that." And I just, what? I mean, you are the guys doing this. It's not me. Why I think that people that? people need permission. Like this is so. What something that we've done for the project is we've t- we've taken a lot of time to talk to people who are within consensus and people who are outside of consensus. And the people who are young and s- just starting out on their careers need people who are emeritus professors and who are older to be speaking out and making noise and pointing out all of these problems because the emeritus professors are the only ones that are capable of doing it. Like the guy who wins the Nobel Prize for something that he then realizes is wrong needs to be the one who's who's clanging the bell and being like, hey, I made a mistake. We made a mistake. This is, we yeah. need to fix this because yeah, otherwise... working against that. I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I think that people... Talk oh. to Penrose. He'll be up for it. Yeah. Oh. say thinks he was wrong. Yeah, there you go. I mean, I think that there are people who are like that. And I think that there needs to be some mechanism for offering them even greater glory for being contrarian. And that might have to do on on the glory of personal relationships where the younger students and the younger professors are given the ability to really start to work on bigger questions by virtue of the older guards being able to turn around to say, hey, hey this has been a mistake. Yeah, and we the should... Ones that are, they're the ones that are least likely to do that because they're the ones that are most vested and their egos are tied up and their salaries and their everything. You know, it's hard. I think that we should uh, start like a deathbed confessional program for, <laughs> uh, for elderly physicists. <laughs> That's a great idea. <laughs> you know, I, I volunteer. I would be happy to go visit the nursing homes and various other care facilities and the corners of the world and just, you know, just be like, do you have any regrets in yeah. terms of your physics? Well, you know, it's Dr. Quite Elizabeth Kubler-Ross meets physics. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know, there is a problem with all of this. Uh, and I, I give you a couple of names. Talk to Peter Higgs. He doesn't, um, he was one of my lecturers at, at Edinburgh University when I was there, and I know what he, I know what he thinks about his mechanism, and perhaps you want to talk to him about the Higgs mechanism and so forth. Um, and the other person would be Roger Penrose, who I think will be up for saying, "Oh yeah, but it's just an idea, you know," and uh, and actually it's probably not right. I think he would be up for it. I think he's uh, he's that kind of guy. We should try again. We, we interacted with his secretary briefly, I believe, but uh, didn't go any further than that, unfortunately. I mean, that's the problem with talking to people outside of the establishment is then the established people look at our 
show and they're like i don't want to be on the same show as somebody who's not establishment and then it's it's a it's a very difficult task um you know not to toot our own horn but we're trying kind of trying the impossible here uh, you but, are, and you're yeah. doing a great job trying it. <laughs> Thank you. It. Are we, are we re- uh, when are we going to start recording? Any minute now. We, no, uh, we've been recording this whole time. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Good. Yeah. Okay. So it's it's a very conversation. It's a very conversational style. Like this is this is how we work this out. If we so what what's happened in the past is um, we'll record a conversation that is maybe a little bit too meandery because we're really trying to like figure out the the confines of of each other's ideas and we come back and we can record a second one and and sometimes that that works better but this is this is the style this is the like the back and forth of trying to understand i have to say i'm thoroughly enjoying talking to you two about it and i'm delighted that the younger generation are are are, are being this skeptical and are trying to do this kind of thing i think what you're doing is extremely important and extremely valuable and also a lot of fun i was i was blown away i don't even remember how somebody somebody linked me to your work and i remember opening the page and first of all being like Okay, these people are very sane. Like it's a beautiful web page. It's well put together. Do you know do you know the Time Cube website? This Time is cute. Yes. Um this is this is no, a I meme. Mean, this is a funny. meme from the nineties, which is the archetype for insane physics presentations. Where because we have a project where we open up our inbox to anyone who has a theory, we have a stack of crazy theories. People will send us stuff where they're like, you have to talk to this person. And you go and you look at the website and they're like, I have a perpetual motion machine that also produces infinite quantities of, you know, drinking water from salt. And you're like, I don't I don't know that that's realistic. And so you look at all these websites and you start to get this flavor for what for what is sane and what isn't. And I opened up the Quicycle website and the first thought I had was, this is so beautiful and sane. Like these people are clear thinkers, they're organized. And then I started looking deeper into it and I was just, I felt like I had found someone who was working on the same questions as we were. And it is so rare to find that because Right. Almost, almost no one is looking for something that is the is is the the fundament. That's how I felt when You're I right found John. <laughs> yeah, so it's I'm really good. Fan. Well, we had a. There's another chap you should talk to. That's Peter Rowlands at Liverpool, and uh, and um, and he's doing some stuff on fundamentals. But finding people who are really working on the fundamental stuff. This really at at, at this level. There's really only a handful of us. There's really less than 10, as far as we can work out worldwide. And just to put one other thing from our group on your radar, I'm not sure if you got that deep into our website, but also Viv Robinson, who I mentioned before, has been doing some phenomenal stuff on gravity, on Einstein, on on, on showing how so many people have misunderstood something in Einstein's math in general relativity, which has led them to gravitational infinities, which can't possibly exist if you think about it. Um, and he's basically found the exact solution to Einstein's theories of general relativity is taken. He's found the quantum equation of gravity, which which gives you Newton to the first approximation, which gives you um, general relativity to the second approximation. And the exact solution gives you the accretion disk that they found in, in the LA, those images that they mm-hmm. took around the black, the supposedly the black hole the center of the galaxy. His theory generates that exact topology. Um, so mm. it's fascinating stuff. So definitely something worth looking at. Somewhere. Yeah, and I'm it's an, it's like a non-relativistic take on how to generate these patterns. No, no, it's oh. it's 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 like it's an extra. It's Einstein was looking at this, and what he did is for the things that he wanted to do, he took the first two terms in a perturbation expansion, so uh, of of an exponential. So Viv's taken the exponential and had a look at what the thing should look like. Yeah. If you, if you, Specifically, the, the the Schwarzschild the Schwarzschild strong field solution is Einstein made a, an approximation. Where he said, you know, one over, you know, negative one over one plus alpha over R is indistinguishable from, you know, negative one minus alpha over R if R is much larger than alpha. So mathemat- it's a mathematical approximation for simplicity's sake in the particular equation, but it's only true when R is much larger than alpha. But Schwarzschild but to took it as an exact solution in any case, which led to gravitational infinities, which has been a big problem, which led to black holes and all of those kinds of things, which 
require infinite energy, which is not available. Mm -hmm. I mean, I view this as a as a first conversation in a series of conversations because these are questions that our audience is very interested in, um, that we have other collaborators who would be interested in talking to you guys. And so if if it's something that you're interested in continuing, we can put a pin in it now and basically plan oh, to well, continue. I have to say that sure. um, there is a mind a technical problem in a sense in that um i'm down for some pretty major surgery in a few weeks time oh my goodness so oh, sorry that means that um and it, apparently it's quite high risk surgery so uh, so so i might not be around for that long so um we'll be around. So, Okay, so so oh, hold on. Then in that case, would you be interested? So something that we did with Pierre Marie and something that we've done with uh, other emeritus professors is we've basically given them the floor to lay out their ideas and oh, yeah. use it in context of of almost like a like a, a documentary, a documentary, a library, uh, a, a, a a repository of these ideas, so that they're in one place. And I mean, obviously, you have a website, you have a group, you have a foundation. But if you're interested in having it hosted and condensed for a different medium, we could plan to do that before your surgery. Well, uh, th that would be marvelous. We have been thinking about doing something similar ourselves for some time. I would ask that if we do produce, if you do produce such a video, or if we co collectively produce such a such a system, that we'd be allowed to host it on our website as well. Of or course. We will link through. But, uh, but but we also have permission to uh, move that around and post it as well. Would that be okay with you guys? Yeah, of course. Yeah, for sure. of course. So Anastasia, you, so if I'm hearing you correctly, you're saying this this is just a great opening chat to kind of get on the same page, but wouldn't necessarily record now. Is that what you're saying? Well, I think they are recording, Arnie. It's okay. Oh, you are recording. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah we've uh, we've recorded yeah. this entire conversation. I think that it's been it's been a fantastic orienting conversation, and it's hard when there's so many ideas in play to be able to focus it into into one bin. And so I, I guess I there was um. I think sometimes the best thing to do with something like this, where there's so many ideas, is to crack open all those ideas and i think that's what we and our audience you know we're really a community we're just encountering these ideas for the first time and so there's many leads we could follow up on but i think there's been great value in the discussion we've had today and i, I really think people will appreciate it i know they will actually so um yeah. you know that exploration is where the real value is and so we have to kind of approach these issues with more luxury of depth as we as we move forward but this is a good starting yeah. place for sure yeah um, you guys are doing a great job here in terms of getting stuff out which should be out there the carver meat stuff was i've only seen the carver meat stuff i haven't seen anything else yet i haven't had the time to go through in detail i might suggest that you listen to arnie's talk the one he was just talking about mm. it'll give you a great introduction and starting point mm -hmm. especially the first the first part of that talk is kind of an overview of what i was talking about about the theory Mm -hmm. And that's a that's a great starting point. The second part of the talk goes into detail on some aspects of spin of this. But then I, I should say that in any endeavor like this, we, we are a bunch of people who can hold three or four different th contradictory theories in the head at the same time. We're, we're putting a lot of, trying to put a lot of understanding into, for example, the one that we were just talking about with whether we should look at the thing as being purely in terms of the bookends, the interactors, or one could look at it as being fields, which then mix up to give you the bookends or the bookends give you the fields. I think that's, and, and that is, people can get very hot under the collar about that kind of discussion. I think it's, but, 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 um, uh, I mean, would you like to take a moment to lay out some of your ideas right now, Arnie, what, or, or would you prefer to come back another time? Um, both way, either way um because you know, we haven't heard it we haven't heard enough from you i feel like i, I would from me I would, yeah yeah i would be very curious to you know if you could summarize some of those ideas we'll definitely put the link to the video and the talk in the description of this but it'd be cool to maybe get some perspectives from you be, before we let you go uh, i think if you, if you went into the spin stuff arnie um just 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 saying about investigating spin space and and, and spin interactions Sure. Um, you feel. 
I mean, we're not in a hurry, just to be clear. Like, we're, we're not in a hurry. We have time. Uh, well, so the talk that I did on Saturday was designed to, to A, lay out the foundation um, of John's theory on which it's all built, because the greatness of it is that it's, it's not only fully, fully relativistic, but it's intuitive. You can actually understand for the first time what the electron is and why it has its charge and why it does what it does. And mm. to me, that's just that just changes the whole conversation because in the past, you're working on axiomatic things, you're working on mathematical constructs. It's it's not very intuitive. And what you were saying earlier about the younger generation coming in, I think they really resonate with that intuitive understanding. They want to be able to picture these things in their mind, at least in some way. Anyway, so... I lay out the 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 you know the beginning the substructure of the electron which is John's theory, um, and then John and I have been discussing how that that resolves into the separate components of the quantum spin of the electron, which is interesting. That the electron is made if the electron is made of of a photon as we believe it is in the rotating photon model. Photons have circular polarization, which means that you are creating a particle out of a photon that has circular polarization, and then you're taking that circular polarization and you're making it do a double loop rotation. So that's already a second aspect of spin, if you want to call it that. And as a result of that circular polarization going around, it has an imbalance of angular momentum. It's going to cause that whole ring structure to tumble in the third dimension, creating a spherical symmetry. Yet it's doing it around itself because the only thing that's there is the photon going around itself at the speed of light. Um, now, this is all stuff that's been developed by John. What I've tried to do, I come from a more of a chemistry background. Mm. So from the beginning of our interactions, I've always been thinking, how does John's theory play out on the level of chemistry? So the first actual question that we started looking into which and writing about which led us down this rabbit hole was uh, the very strong paramagnetism of oxygen of the oxygen molecule because it's a fascinating concept when you look at the traditional bonding mechanism all the electrons are paired when you look at molecular orbital theory you have these you know two unpaired electrons in molecular in antibonding molecular orbitals but when you look at the paramagnetism of oxygen i mean sodium has one unpaired electron its paramagnetism is like less than 20, I think, then scandium is like around 300, but oxygen is like 7,000 for liquid oxygen. It's And, the, you know, solid oxygen is like it goes up to about 10,000. So to me, it seemed difficult to explain why it would have such a disproportionately strong paramagnetism based on, you know, an understanding of, of its, the current understanding of its electron structure. Mm -hmm. And that kind of led us down... Um, you know, to start looking at all these things. And we've looked at, we started looking at some of the D block elements and we started looking at the atomic orbitals from this point of view. How would the concept of these electrons and these di-electron interactions happen in the context of, of the atomic system, which is another interesting conversation in and of itself, because think about a P orbital and an S orbital in the same shell. In the traditional, you know, in the traditional single electron um extrapolations of the hydrogen atom you get these the p orbital shapes in the x y and the z direction but these are electrons and if you add multiple electrons into the same shell they're not going to ignore each other so to me it seems far more reasonable that when you have a full shell of eight electrons at the end of the second row for example in neon that it's going to be far more stable when you have four electrons four di electrons in that space as opposed to having you know one di electron in an s shell and then six individual electrons in opposite lobes of a, you know, that seems like a far less stable scenario. Anyway, so we, we've delved a little bit into that, which is why also we were building that interactive periodic table on our classical website also to try and show what these resonant structures might do in the atomic system. Um, it's really interesting how in chemistry too, it's particularly in molecular chemistry, you see these wild hybridizations like water, for instance, I think has like 50 different hybridization states. It's, it's not like you have these beautiful hydrogen orbitals that we're traditionally familiar with when we think about quantum mechanics. And that's one of the things that I really like about this theory too. It, it's helped me to imagine when I think of a covalent molecule, when I think of the hydrogen molecules, for example, it's you've got two electrons with opposite spins that are bonding, so that's creating this di-electron state. So I think about it like almost like a case space, like a like a discrete crystal line unit. In a metallic crystal, I visualize this, you know, the 3D electron gas, this matrix of electron density with the 
a positive atomic cores suspended through charge cancellation and repelling one another, staying a distance apart. That's exactly what you have in the hydrogen molecule also. You have this di-electron oblong charge density matrix within which the two nuclei are suspended through charge cancellation with the electron cloud and and increasing the field between them creates that repulsion between them through constructive interference of charge. So it's like a discrete crystalline unit, and it's such an intuitive way of thinking about it in my mind. And then based on your question, when you go to all these excitation levels, you're talking about an overall quantum system. So I think people already get lost when you start thinking about individual electrons being excited in the systems, because it's not. It's an entire resonant quantum, single quantum state that mm-hmm. will have to find its successive and ener- next the next stable higher or lower energy state based on its gain or loss of, of energy. Mm. That seems like a bigger problem in science too altogether with you know trying to reduce things down to these individual actors and you know even defining biology turns out to be elusive I think for similar reasons because organisms require one another to survive. You know I need those trees outside or I'm going to die for sure, right? They make my oxygen like it's very difficult to untangle the, these discrete pieces from such a complex and interactive system. I feel the I same way about interdisciplinary study. You can't separate, you know, you can't, how do you deal with chemistry without knowing physics and biology and, you know, all these other things, because they're all interrelated. Hmm. Do yeah, you, that, oh, go sorry. Ahead. Go ahead, John. I say you. Well, I was, I was, I mean, I had, I had a question that I'm going to write down, and I, it, I'll, I'll come back to it. It's okay. Okay, I, th- I, th- I think that when you're looking at these complex systems, one, there is a big simplicity to be found in those complex systems, because what you're looking for is you're looking for harmony. You're looking for a harmony, a harmony between systems, a harmony in. In, 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 in water is a fantastic example. The harmony in ice crystals is astonishing. The fact that the the the, the, the atoms are choosing to that the molecules are choosing to form in a six-fold symmetry when they're so very far apart is magnificent we're talking about a resonance a harmony over an entire crystal which is letting those making those water molecules move to the right place to give that astonishing symmetry but it's not just that um when, when we were developing high mobility gallium arsenide heterostructure devices uh, Tom Fox and, and Jeff Harris were the were the main uh, people pushing that, and they still have some of the high, highest mobility and um, material ever made. The conversation there was in a pub over with a bunch of beer mats, talking about the movement of atoms on the surface of a crystal to sh- to, to try and make that more uniform. And um, we came up with some suggestions. I came up with some suggestions as to what to do with that that proved to in- increase the mobility even further. And that's the quantum mechanics of motion and of the harmony and the and, and the uh, resonance, really, of a- allowing that or enhancing the possibility that that sort of thing can happen. Cat is such a huge field of study. And then when we're looking at the human body and going into biology, where it gets even worse than chemistry, and <laughs> but again, the kind of things that are happening there, it's it it isn't the it isn't just the genes. It isn't just the RNA and DNA. It's the electrostatic. In, it's the it's the quantum environment in which they find themselves. And people are doing fascinating stuff where they're putting an electric field gradient onto onto worms they cut in half, and the things grow two heads. There's this rather than a head and a tail, which they would do if they didn't have that, or two tails, I suppose, if they go the other way in the voltage. So all of these things are interconnected, and they're all. You have to look for the harmony. You have to look for the resonance, because that's what nature's doing. Nature's looking for that interaction. It's looking for that harmony. It's looking for that resonance. Well, that's and one I of the think that, that, I, that I love about John's theory also is that when you know most people think of an atom as a proton and an electron cloud, but really the hydrogen atom is a. John explains it this way, and I love the concept. It's a proto electron. It's it's a, it's a new quantum state that's not a proton plus an electron. It's a new thing. Mm. Mm. which is great. Yeah, I feel like biology is learning this hard lesson of resonance too because the basic Darwinian model seems to not fully encompass the idea that the organism also modifies its niche. And so there's a feedback between the niche specifying the form of the organism and the 
organism specifying the structure of the niche and then you get these these resonant interactions and so things turn out to be yeah. they have the ability to jump between wildly different energy conformations very quickly because of this resonant uh, process. I, I had exactly the same thought that there has to be that two-way feedback system in genetics. It, it's epigenetics. It has to work that way. It simply is. And the people are beginning to realize this and study this as well. It's just great. It's just magnificent. That's proper science. This is what science should be doing. It has to be, it has to get to the simplicity and not go for these ridiculously complex things which are untestable. Mm. Has to what science and is. just speaking to what John was saying also before about the resonance, about the harmony, about these new things, the, the, one of the most beautiful parts of John's theory, in my mind, is the formation of the dielectron, that he, that helium full S shell. It's because you have two elect. The question, one of the things that I dealt with in my talk last weekend is how is it that electrons can bond at all? They have the same charge. They should repel each other. It's something that people don't seem to really address in other branches of science. And John's theory handles it so beautifully because not only when, especially when we look into these three components of spin, what is the difference between a spin up and a spin down electron? Um, so one of that's one of the ideas we've been developing as well. And the difference being the direction of circular polarization of the photon that's making up the particle. So they literally have opposite chirality as they're going around the torus in the same left-handed direction. But when you, when you flip these two particles anti-parallel magnetically, which they're going to want to do spontaneously because then their magnetic fields are aligned equally and opposite in every point in that within that volume, which cancels magnetic field energy, literally draining all this energy out of the system, making it such a stable state. But also on the level of spin, on all three levels of spin, you have counter rotation. You have these, it's almost like you have counter rotating um, vortices moving through each other as photons are able to do, completely balancing that angular momentum on a, on a sub quantum level and creating this incredibly powerful spin coherence, which while you have electrostatic repulsion from the light charges, you have magnetic <coughs> field cancellation from the anti parallel cancellation, which kind of offsets each other and then introduce this very powerful spin coherence. And that is why the dielectron is such a highly stable and desirable state for electrons to be in, despite the fact that they have light charges. So this is just one of several fundamental understandings that John's theory is able to explain in such an intuitive way. <laughs> which, is really why, which is why as soon as you start thinking of the electron as an activity of the Ur stuff, everything starts to slot into place much more easily because you can right. start to approximate it on the level of of behaviors and objects as opposed to just something that's some black box where you're like, I don't know, the math says that it does, but I guess that's... And and one of my favorite things about it that John actually said this weekend in, in the Q&A is that the electron is a topology, is the mm -hmm. best way to define it. I like that. John might want to talk more about that. I I oh, so I want to I want to pose a question that no one's been able to really answer to satisfaction for me. Uh, what is a proton versus a hydrogen? Okay, righty ho. <laughs> it's a proton versus a hydrogen, right? Okay. Well, the thing is, first first thing is, what is a proton? And if you think that the electron is made of a, a kind of electromass magnetic radiation, then you don't, we're not obviously not going to think the proton's made of green cheese. It's also the same sort of thing. But what is it? It's far more massive than the electron. It's 1,800 times more massive. It's a much more solid object. But to answer what's happening in the hydrogen atom first, I want to talk about muons and taons. Now, the muon is very similar to the electron, and the taon is very similar to the electron, except for the fact that the muon is about 200 times more massive than the uh, than the uh, electron and the tau is about 3,000 times more massive. So how does that come about? Well, in, 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 in the theory, the way it happens is that you have an electron, which is really something which is going round and round in circles twice. It's like, a, it's, like a, it's a double loop, but it goes, if you imagine that as being something which is going up and then coming down, it's looping around and around. Okay, I'm really doing that four, to, four times, but I'm just going to take two of these. And take that as being one unit, one unit of... Of, 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 of material, but it's really a rotation. So what I can do is I can take that rotation and I can turn it around and I can rotate the rotation and make it do the same thing. I can make that double loop 
itself go around a double loop. And if I do that, what I'll find is I'll find that instead of having things going up, for everything going up and going down, I'll have another one which is going up and down again. So I'll have four such objects. And if you take that into 3D, and that'll be happening in X and in Y and in Z or in three, three separate dimensions. If you take those four objects and have a look at how effective they are in trapping light, in, in interacting, in, in other words, uh, by shadowing light, then the number of possibilities you have for matching with a photon going in each dimension are not four, because you have you have six. You have six combinations of two out of four. You have this pair, this pair, this pair, this pair, this pair, and the outside pair. So you have six such combinations. And that means that one should expect a particle at about six cubed times the mass of the electron that was a rotation of a rotation, extra rotation within those rotations. And indeed, the muon mass is very close to that. 216 times the mass of the electron. Then if one goes to six of these, if you do the same trick again, then one finds there are 15 combinations of two out of six, and 15 cubed is approximately the mass of the tau on. Now, what I think a proton is, is a proton is the same kind of stuff going around loops, but the loops are not what a quark is, what the quark, where the quark symmetry comes from, in my view. And it's a real symmetry, it's a proper symmetry. One sees families of particles that are without any doubt formed of, uh, of, of, of either three systems of the same sort or a sort anti-sort system, which are QQ bar mesons or QQQ hadrons. What I think is happening with those is that one has a photon which is going round with the same kind of way that an electron goes round, but it isn't making a complete loop where it bites its own tail. That's true for the electron, the muon, and the tauon, but not true for the elements of the proton, which we call quarks. Now, what I think of quark is it's something which has some motion which goes round and round like an electron. It's like an electron. But what it does, it goes, comes in, and it doesn't quite make the full 720 degrees. It comes out again at right angles. Mm. So it transforms x to y or y to z or z mm. to x or x to minus z or whatever, but it changes things through 90 degrees. Now, if one postulates such a thing, that's not a particle because it's not something which is self-recreating, coming back to what we were talking about before. But one can make a self-recreating object by doing the following. You can have something that goes in, does something complicated here, comes out at right angles, and then stick it into an exactly equal but opposite thing that does something complicated and goes back in. But one of them goes around the loop left-handed and the other one goes around the loop right-handed. So it goes around a figure of eight, left, right, left, right. If one associates a left-handed loop with a quark and a right-handed loop with an anti-quark, then one could say you could take a quark and an anti-quark and make a particle that's actually a self-recreating particle. And the lightest such thing would look very like a muon because you have the same number of crossings. You have a loop and then you have a loop on top of it, which is sitting in the same space because the thing follows this quantum bicycle motion. So it should have approximately the same mass as the muon which, of course, the, the um, pi meson does. So you have an object there which is more complex, but is a quark and an anti-quark. If you take the quark to be the symmetry that just transforms x to y, for example, then y back to x, and then x to y, and y back to x, no problem. But imagine you wanted to make a particle that didn't have left-handed and right-handed loops, but only had right-handed loops. Then you very quickly realize that you can't, make such an object with two quarks, because you can go x to y and then y to z, but z isn't x. So um, so if you, if you, you, you can go back to my, you, you just can't make a full, a full circuit. But what you can do is you can go x to y, y to z, z to x. That is a full circuit, and that full circuit is what I think the proton is. Mm. It's three quarks, and it's three quarks, it's three quarks. It's three topologies that are very nearly electron topologies superimposed one on, on one another, like the tau on. Now, the proton is quite a lot lighter than the tau on, about half the mass of the tau on. And the reason for that is that as it, as it, wherever it makes a contact, that contact is so, – so it's coming out of one thing and going into another thing. That part of the flow is common, so it's a reduced, slightly reduced um, 
flow, hmm. <clears throat> and hence is less massive. Hmm. So that's what I think the proton is. Now, if you want to make a hydrogen atom from a proton, what you're going to do is you're going to take one of these objects, which is, you see, if you, if you do this, if you go around like that, what you're doing is you're going, I'm going right, 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 right. I'm doing a three-quarter turn. But three rights make a left. If you go right three times, it's the same as going left. So you end up with an object that has the same direction of flow of the electron. And the direction of flow comes from the mass term. So it has the same stuff as the electron, but it has far, far higher mass. But it has the same charge because it's also an interactor. The charge comes from equilibration and interactions. So what happens when a proton, so a proton and an electron, they are naturally made for each other. One of them's positively charged, the other one's negatively charged. Warmth, clock, hydrogen atom. But what does that hydrogen atom look like? Well, that hydrogen atom looks like a resonant harmonic interaction between an electron and a proton. Now, the proton's 10 to the minus 15 meters Compton wavelength, the electron about 10 to the minus 13 meters. But the hydrogen atom is 10 to the minus 10 meters. What happens is, take an electron, it's quite small, give it a proton, proton takes the electron and the electron takes the proton, and they both blow up to have the same Compton wavelength of about 10 to the minus 10 meters. So this tiny electron, which we think of as being a small particle, put into a hydrogen atom is blown up by three orders of magnitude. The reason it's doing that is because a lot of its interaction is proton to electron. This thing isn't a proton and an electron, it's a proto-electron. The flow is a continuous flow through the whole system, through both the electron and the proton. So, so I think the formation of a hydrogen atom is the formation of a new kind of particle, a hydrogen atom. So I think mm. forms a hydrogen mm. molecule. What happens there is you have a figure of eight flow between the hydrogen in the way that Arnie's talking about and beginning to develop in terms of in terms of covalent bonding models for these systems. Mm. We so what, what I'm hearing you say is that the substance isn't changing, just the motion of the substance is changing, something like that. That's right. It's just the topology of the path that's changing. And like what that. one's doing is one now has two topologies sitting there. One has a topology which is a set of three curls, that's the um, proton, and, and a single curl, that's the electron. And the two of them fit together in such a way as to reduce the total energy. But in reducing the total energy, large, smaller energy, small is large and large is small. Smaller energy, much smaller energy, means the whole, both of the systems blow up, both the electron and the proton blow up. So what I'm looking at is people tend to draw this as a, as a, as a, as a, as a, as a, as a proton being a point and then an electron cloud around it. That's wrong because the proton gains a Compton wavelength too, which is the same as the Compton wavelength of the electron because of momentum conservation. So they both have the same Compton wavelength. They both blow up. You end up with electroproton, which is a cloud of proton containing a cloud of electron where the two things are fitted together as well as they can, apparently by a factor of about a thousand, to reduce the interaction with the rest of the universe for mm. them, for everything, a thousand times weaker. Okay, so let me, let me clarify this for a second. So are you implying that the old school model of the, the proton as as something that sits at the center of the atom is incorrect? Yes, and I think it's just bad thinking because I think in ordinary quantum mechanics it's quite clear that's the case as well. One just has to calculate the Compton wavelength of the proton and one will realize that it's also just as big and it has to be spherically symmetric and it's in an S state. So it's just it's just stupidity. Common or garden, stupidity. It's a lack of thinking. It's like people haven't thought of that. They're so concentrated on what the electron's doing that they're not thinking about what the proton's doing. That's so fa so that that's a true interweaving. That's a true interweaving, yes. Oh, that's so cool. One sinks into the other. Yeah, um, into what it, it, it makes perfect sense to me. <laughs> We've actually made an animation of of something like this I too. We I love your animation. Okay. <laughs> you on the money. <laughs> oh, right on, right on. It's so funny because we like we the other we've been trying to figure out like how thick the wall of the atom is. Like we go to the woods and we sit around and we're trying to we're trying to figure out how is there void inside the atom or is there not? I think I think let me just talk as let me. Put a different hat on as a 
as a as a, a quantum physicist. Ah, I love it. So, um, <laughs> you actually have the hat. <laughs> okay, so um, so it depends. It if you just wait a minute, let's have a proper quantum physicist hat. Here we are. I uh, know. <laughs> <laughs> Quantum physicist hat. Here we go. This one will do. There we are. Mm. So, if we if we think think as just a quantum physicist, so this is, if you like, um, me in 19, uh, 1985, when I'm thinking in terms of the quantum point contact stuff. No, it's not a void. But what's happening is that you, so you have a you know, charge distribution which comes which goes down inverse square, then gets to the edge of the um, of the uh, proton, and then inside, yes. It is a void in terms of charge. If, if you want to want to look at charge, it's a void, but it's not a void because this material, which is running through it, each other, one of them positively charged, the other one negatively charged. That's all happening. The dynamics is all there, but it's just internal. So, and then there's a perfect cancellation of those two charges. The charge of a hydrogen atom is exactly zero, of course, because it's plus one minus one. Of course, that's people think anyway but if one looks at the distribution of that then yes um and outside of that thing the charge is zero if you looked inside in detail and tried to scatter off a hydrogen atom so imagine i probe the hydrogen atom by sticking particles in and, hit, and try to hit it then yes you'd either hit the proton or the electron and you're more likely to hit um hit the electron i think i don't know interesting question but yes, you'd hit one or the other. Mm. So, so if you probed it with a high energy electron or muon or something and zapped it in there, you'd, you'd hit either one or the other mm. uh, with, I think, roughly equal probabilities. Mm. So what both of these, these streams are occurring simultaneously, but interacting in a way that voids their effect. Yes. W uh, uh, mm, mm, mm. Voids we've, the charge. We've thought so, about... So We've thought about charge in terms of surface patterning of of these resonance structures. Yes, I think that's right. Have a, have a look at the pictures on Quisicle in the periodic table of the elements. I and have a look at how the surface pattern these things. It's beautiful. I saw the, uh, the uh, particle-antiparticle patterning. Arnie, do you want to do you want to talk about the patterning that you get on more complex systems? What they look like? Um, yeah, actually, the first thing I wanted to mention also was that uh, I mentioned Viv Robinson before, one of our colleagues in Quasical. He has a, a different view than John does on the proton and the neutron, which is also very intuitive and very similar in the sense that it's also rotating photon. It's also double loop rotation per wavelength, um, much higher energy harmonics. But And I love the, the music analogy here too. If you think of you know, the fundamental vibration on a string and then you superimpose all the higher harmonics upon it. So the electron would just be a, you know, a simple double loop rotation or much lower energy resonance. But when you have 1800 times more energy, the harmonic resonances will be much, you know, a more complex set. And Viv is actually think of, thinks of it in terms of the fundamental proton resonance and then you have one third harmonics and one ninth harmonics and in his in his calculations those one third harmonics also match the, the conceptually the quark it's a different way of looking at it than john's would be to say that that what the quarks are is they're not they're not particles in and of themselves as john said that they're not complete structures in and of themselves but they are harmonic resonance substructures within the larger coherence that is the proton, which is also a really cool way of thinking about it. And what comes out of his theory is a is a beautiful and self-consistent way of looking at, at uh, the bonding between the nucleons to form the nucleus. It explains also radioactivity, explains how radioactive decay happens and why. It explains why when, when um, solid matter is ejected as radioactive decay, it's always an alpha particle. I, I mean, other than, you know, electrons and positrons i'm saying when you have the massive components it's always an alpha particle and there's a reason for that is because those are the structural units that fit together within the nucleus which is really oh, yeah. beautiful it's a, it's a trifermion boson so it has it has a, a boson of protons a boson of neutrons and a boson of electrons 
That's yeah. a gorgeously stable state. Yeah, in helium, I, yeah. I should say about Viv's bottle, it's much more advanced than mine is, and I prefer it to my own. I think so. You should get him on to talk about it. Yeah. And if you go to the Quasical website, one of the tabs we have is called Breakthroughs, and it lists, um, you know, John's substructure of the electron. It, it lists Viv's, Viv's concept of the nucleons and their bonding, and it talks about Viv's model of gravity a little with some sources in order to delve further. So that's a really good place to dive in, to, you know, to look at those things. Mm. Um, yeah, I, hope, I hope we can get him on the show. That would be fantastic. Yeah. Mm. I'm yeah, looking. Sure to too. I'm looking at the periodic table of the elements right now. And so what uh, what I'm seeing is that if you go to something like barium, you have these multiple nested spherical orbitals and then there's these smaller spheres that are that are inside of the superimposed orbitals. Can you can you kind yeah. of those those spheres that was just the you know the graphic tool I had at my disposal. Those those spheres within the orbitals are just showing the direction of the lobes and the, the direction of the highest electron density. It's not implying that those lobes are, are little spheres within that area. Mm. In fact, if you take a look at the carbon uh, atom on their periodic table, carbon atoms, uh, sp3 hybridized, its second shell has four degenerate equal energy electrons. So that makes a tetrahedral symmetry. And even in the traditional view that the sp3 hybrid orbitals form tetrahedral, tetrahedrally with respect to one another, but yet they still have those lobe, those traditional lobe shapes. Mm. But in our estimation, that can't be that way. Those tetrahedral things have to spread out to fill the entire second shell of the atom because mm. the nuclear charge has to be cancelled spherically, symmetrically in every direction. So if you take those four sp3 hybrid electrons are still going to be tetrahedral, but each of those lobes is going to be one fourth of the volume of that shell mm. and the electron density will be obviously the highest towards the center of the face and it'll decrease towards the nodal boundaries because of electron repulsion but it will never get down to zero because it can't um and this is what i was alluding to earlier is when you look at the neon atom and you have eight electrons in the second shell it makes far more sense to me that those are going to be four tetrahedrally oriented dielectrons because dielectrons are so incredibly stable that if they have if electrons have the opportunity to form dielectrons they will because it's a far lower energy state so i don't believe that the orthogonal xyz axis p orbital structure ever occurs in nature naturally because every if you look at the second row of the periodic table every atom there involves some kind of symmetrical hybrid resonance and to have you know, the XYZ within a, a dielectron shell, to me, is not going to be particularly stable. And that brings up a very interesting point, is when you go to argon, the that's on the third end of the third row of the periodic table, then you have, you know, these, you have eight electrons in the second shell, and now you have eight electrons around it in the third shell. And if those form di these four dielectron tetrahedral arrangements, one within the other, then those tetrahedra will be antiparallel to each other, so that the dielectron in one shell relative to the dielectron in the shell and underneath it, they're going to orient themselves in such a way that the middle of one lobe is going to lie directly above the nodal intersection points on the shell inside of it because that'll minimize electron repulsion between the different shells. So that's mm. one of the ideas that we've been speculating about. But you mentioned barium. So as you build the atom up, every completed shell has to be a symmetrical, resonant, harmonic, symmetrical state of those electrons in that full shell. So any subsequent shell is going to has to form those also those symmetries, which means if you compare the number of those dielectrons in each shell, it's going to determine what type of geometry you have. You know, you're only going to have tetrahedral in certain shells, but then when you get into the the D block and the F block, and now you're starting to have multiple electrons. You know, you start to have to look at these at, at more the, the higher di directional platonic symmetries to find that the foundation, and then it'll always be a that'll always vary from that perfect symmetry based on the number of you know electron domains that are present. 
Yeah, this is. I mean, this is very cool because we've we've talked about this too, of, about the necessity to produce some kind of visualization like this. And so I, I can't tell you how happy I am to see that you've done it. <laughs> well, what's super cool about this, and I, and you may notice if you try and look at the D and the F block elements, they're still password protected because we haven't finished going through it. But one of the really cool things that's come out of this is if you look at the paramagnetism strength across the D block elements. It's a very the trend is seems to be a little interesting and and unintuitive, and just just to underscore that, an element that has one unpaired electron has a stronger paramagnetism than ones that have two or three or even five. Manganese has five unpaired electrons, and it has nowhere near the paramagnetism even of of um, up the oxygen molecule, for example. So one of the things that's come out of these geometries that we're looking at of these orbital geometries when you start combining in these interactions is that it creates these geometries and then if you look at the unpaired electrons within those geometries it creates interactions such that it now we feel it, it accounts for the the strength trend of, of the paramagnetic strength across the d block there's there's a logic to that which without the geometries that we're talking about they those i mean it's not the same way of looking at it so i don't know how the traditional approach to those orbital combinations would account for the difference in paramagnetic strength. But we seem to have a theory that at least has a logical, you know, entry. It's just at the beginning stages of developing it, but it's kind of cool. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, I love this is, I love that chemists always think in terms of, you know, these surfaces interacting and it, it's always been a structural science to some extent. The way that molecules will pair together has a lot to do with their shape essentially. And so it's really cool that, you've taken on this project and started to make sense of the shapes of the actual orbitals themselves. Yeah, definitely. Um, something that we've been talking about, which we've we've been meaning to, to dive deeper in, but I'm not sure that I, I have done so to my satisfaction, is the relationship between unpaired valence electrons and charge. Right, because you can have a, you can have, and and I don't know if this is a stupid question. And so if it is a stupid question, please tell me. But you can have uh, an atom that has multiple unpaired electrons in its valence shells, but it won't be charged. Well, it's not charged until it picks up the electrons. And well, the, the charge is going to be the number of electrons compared to the number of protons. So if it ionizes, it can be. And that's an interesting thing also, that that electron atoms will prefer to, be, to have a symmetrical electron shell than, they would than to be neutral. Hmm. And we see this in the formulation of sodium chloride. Like sodium and chlorine are much more stable when they form salt. And that's where the sodium stole the chlorine's electron, or vi sorry, vice versa, the chlorine stole the sodium's valence electron. So now the sodium is a full shell. It's a perfectly symmetrical tetrahedral arrangement of di electrons, but it happens to have an imbalance of protons and electrons, so it'll have a positive charge. And the chlorine gained that electron, it now has a full shell of four symmetrical di electrons but it has a negative charge. So now they, they're sticking to each other electrostatically, which but not through electron interaction. Their electrons are completely satisfied, don't want anything to do with one another. It's entirely an electrostatic interaction, which is fascinating. It's just, um, you know, it's kind it's of almost counterintuitive when you think about it. Something's overwhelmed charge, hasn't it? Yeah. So what, what's overwhelmed charge are the other symmetries that are coming through here. Yeah, mm -hmm. the spin. Yeah, the spin. Yeah. It's just interesting because if you go to Stack Exchange or something and you say, what's the relationship between spin and charge? There's just all of these really irate people saying there's no relationship whatsoever. But you just stop and think about it for a second and you're like, look, these unpaired atoms aren't found in that state in nature. They're always becoming an ion or they're interacting, like you said, electrostatically somehow or they're forming gases. And these are what we think of traditionally as these are charged interactions and so there must be some story going on there that's well, just spin spin and i mean charge only arises from the way the spin interacts in the topology makes you sense to me really polarized photon and its electric field when it goes as a photon its electric field's going 360 symmetrically which you know averages to zero but when you take a circularly polarized photon doing 360 degrees for every wavelength and then you put it into a 720 degree double loop for every wavelength, it turns into what John is showing you with the belt is that it actually turns the, it keeps the electric mm. field pointing outwardly directed radially outward the entire time, which is what causes 
it to have a monopole charge. That's the origin of charge. It's the oh, double the rotation of the electric field orienting the charge in a particular direction. Mm -hmm. It's the spin that's giving the charge because what's happening is there's more than one spin going on. There's a spin going on in the around the eye of the torus, but then that 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 spin is itself spinning around the, the axis of the torus, and then the whole torus is tumbling yep. over itself. Why does it do all those things? It does all those things because that minimizes the total energy, minimizes the total field. So you get field cancellation by the tumble. Magnetic field is up in one half cycle, but it's down in the other. So that reduces magnetic field now. So it goes to configuration, which is a minimum energy configuration, of course. And you end up with a charged object with um, well, with with zero magnetic moment, with an inducible magnetic moment in an, in an external magnetic field, which is exactly what you observe for the electron. And we just calculate the charge from the spin, or vice versa. Versa. That was Martin and my ninety-seven paper, and. Uh, and I can't really fathom why it hasn't caused more of a stir than it has. It, it has been fairly well cited, but it hasn't led to any kind of... I, I expected this to lead to a revolution in physics almost immediately. I was sorely disappointed. <laughs> well, it's, like trying to, it's like trying to turn an oil tanker. You know, you've got to allow like 100 miles to like gradually change the momentum. It's a very, you know, science is very phlegmatic in that way. Yeah. You wouldn't believe how many people we talk to who have had discoveries, even ex discoveries that are later recognized in the academic world, who thought everyone would be so excited when they told them the news. And instead, they're across the board, 100% met with yeah. derision. And Welcome to human nature. Well, that's never, that's, that has always been the case in science, throughout scientific history, and it's still the case. A lot of people are laboring under the misapprehension that that stuff only happened in the you know in the history of science, but it's still happening as we speak. Do you have, do you have a sense of how we can make that better? <laughs> yeah, yeah, and and I want to yeah. add something to that because I do have a sense for how to like we've talked on the show about making it better through building technologies and and <laughs> using it in an applied way. But Michael Levin the other day was talking about the fact that he's constantly confronted by the fact that he's building technologies with his new understanding of biology, and people are like, no, doesn't matter. Well, yeah. I think I think nonetheless you're completely right that eventually and the stuff we the stuff we're doing is 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 being ignored not just ignored but actually sh i went to a high energy physics conference where i presented this stuff back in 2014 the first beginnings of the new theory and i was almost physically attacked by this great big guy who 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 was determined to prove me wrong and to have an argument with me but what he didn't know of course is that i was also a high energy physicist i knew all his arguments already so he lost the argument extremely rapidly and that he he was with a gang of people, about ten people, and this big guy, <laughs> and and anyway, it was just hackety chop. Uh, I mean, we, we, yeah, like we've that. heard stories like that. People just like people getting coffee thrown in their face, like unbelievable stuff from scientific yeah. conferences. Well, yeah, that's, no, that that just yeah. shows the extent to which human nature runs our <laughs> thought process. No, it's it's and it's a very important point. And that's that's the reason that I'm working on this nonfiction book called The Animal in the Mirror is because. <laughs> If people don't understand that they're an animal first and a human second, they think that they're already a human and that, that, that the biology is not really affecting their thought process and they can't see beyond it. And if you can't see beyond it, then you're trapped within it. And not only that, that we, our survival instinct, we're group thinkers. The reason we're group thinkers is because our survival instinct is vulnerable and afraid. We can be hurt and there's safety in numbers. So we have, we become group thinkers as part of our biology. So therefore, your sense of security subconsciously comes from your group and its ideology being correct. Mm. So it's literally subconsciously, people don't even realize this, is when you're faced with an idea that threatens what you believe, your survival instinct feels threatened, and people don't even realize that that's the place they're reacting from. But the, the proof of it is any time that you have this emotional response, along with an intellectual argument, it's proof that it's rubbing up against your sense of security, mm -hmm. and that's interfering with your, your, you know, your intellectual. So character. like a thousand years from now, what, how do physicists behave themselves better? Like what strategies, what transformations do you think that the human race could go through to become a more fertile, productive, collaborative community? I think, I think how do we subvert to, that? I, I think that really one has to really cement in the scientific method that things aren't science unless they're subject to the scientific method. Because it's, it's, it's when that happens. That was the great flowering of science in the late 
19th and early 20th century. People were free then. The argument then was about science. It was about experiment. It was about, not to say that didn't, there wasn't quite a lot of resistance to Einstein ideas or de Broglie's ideas and quantum mechanics. There was. Einstein had a lot of trouble getting into the Academy of Sciences in, in Germany because people were strongly, well, believed very strongly that he was talking a load of nonsense. Of course, looking back on it, you don't see it like that. But it has to be that it is the scientific method which, you, which you're working on. Otherwise, you're not a scientist. That's the only way to do it. Because as soon as you allow things to not be testable by experiment, so you can have an opinion about something, oh, yes, this is your opinion, but my opinion is equally valid. As soon as you allow that kind of thing, then you open up the doors to the tribalism which has happened at the moment in science. And that tribalism has happened before because at the end of the 19th century, there were also very strong feelings that everything had already been done. And it was only when things began to really fall apart in the beginning of the 20th century that it allowed the younger generation to start free thinking what was going on. But that, that system had been put in place by people like, um, by, by the older generation, by, by people like Maxwell and Hamilton and, uh, and, 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 uh, and, 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 and Planck and so forth, although Planck also resisted Einstein, who had come up with something that was just completely unexplainable within classical physics. And it was, that gave people freedom because it was all crazy to, do creative things and to think about things. There was a huge flowering of science, and then it closed down again after after theories became non-perturbative. And theorists found they could do some pretty nifty maths, but not have the inconvenience of it having been destroyed by some inconvenient experimental result. That's what we need to do. We need to keep in mind that it's experiment that has primacy. And the best experiment, of course, is not just an experiment. It's what you're saying is proof by engineering, engineering things which otherwise could not be engineered. Would the, would the yeah. space for people who are doing interpretive work, like people looking at the deep past or things they can't do experiments on, would that be a different department like natural philosophy or something? Because there's certainly something that's included in science right now which doesn't involve experimentation. And it, it's useful. So I would... I mean, that, that would be fine with me if that wasn't science and it was something else, but it doesn't seem like it has a home right now. Uh, uh, yeah, Arnie? Yeah, no, the other problem right now that we're having in our current world is that politics and money muddy the waters. As soon as politics and money get involved in any scientific endeavor, they, they merge things, the confusion together to such an extent that it almost becomes impossible for people to tell where the science ends and the politics starts. Um, and so any branch of science that involves large amounts of money is going to fall, is going to have that problem again because of human nature is the lens we have to, to see everything through. Yeah, the people who are running that sort of thing are not so much physicists as, uh, well, as, as, as corporatists. Right. So that's one problem. Another problem that I see in the scientific method is a violation so subtle, I think a lot of people don't even realize that they're doing it. And that is that the order of the scientific method is observation, and then the math comes along to quantify the observation and to write. But if you start with the math and then you go to try and then take the observ the math and then foist it upon the observation, you run into a problem that is unscientific. But uh, people don't realize it for a lot of reasons, and not the least of which is that sometimes it actually does lead to something real, like antimatter, for example, I think was first conjectured based on a mathematical extrapolation, and it turned out to be real. So that just makes the problem worse, because it ha does happen a lot in other areas, and people are not willing to see it as a violation of the scientific method, which it is. Well, it's related to this obsession with beauty, too, to some extent, right? And the idea that things should have this elegance to them, um, when in fact nature can be quite chaotic. And we're seeing this uh, play out, you know, in astronomy right now in terms of planetary science with people thought that planets should, you know, oh, these perfect laws. Originally, it was the circular orbit, which didn't work out. And later now, it's kind of the formation process, like everything should form, should have formed right in place exactly as it is. And that's not working out. And there seems to be all these other levels that if you're just chasing this mathematical beauty, this, this absolute precision, you'll, you'll be led astray. But and it's yeah, it's hard for cool. me it's hard for me to imagine a circumstance where 
people really start to shift their perspective on cosmological questions in a way that's engineering-based, because it's not like you can engineer eternity. And yet... It, 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 uh, but coming back to the original question as well, I think that, yes, there is a place for natural philosophy, but it, 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 it shouldn't... It should be real. It should be taken for being what it is, which is that it is speculation. Yes. Philosoph I mean, I think that philosopher of science should be a legitimate, a legit, a legitimate. Like, I think that, um, like, the minute that you start to take away the title of scientist from people you're gonna come to blows like that's yeah. just I've, I've been in these discussions where i find myself saying that's not science and it just it, an uproar results whoever you're saying it to starts yeah. to freak out tear uh, well because you guys are, are essentially no deep empiricists about this and if we were to bring on a deep rationalist they would say that well you know you're your measurement techniques are faulty, your perceptions are faulty. The only thing you can trust is the deep conception of what could be occurring, the hypothesis in its full elaboration, as long as it's internally consistent and all of this. Yeah. So there's always going to be... And, th and then to try to tell those people that they're not scientists, and it just seems like it's a, it's a World War III waiting to happen, essentially. I think people should have the integrity in science to say when they are stepping outside of the bounds and when they're not. For example, the, th the thing I mentioned earlier about the, the beginning of the universe concept is that science is locked into the laws of physics and causality, which means that we don't have access to the origination of matter and energy at the beginning of time and the beginning of space. So in order to apprehend that question, you have to have the integrity to say, within the boundaries of science and the scientific method, we cannot apprehend that question. However, I'm now going to step outside of those bounds into a more philosophical mindset, in which case I can now talk about those concepts as on a philosophical level. But people don't have that integrity. They're going to rather want to say, I'm going to explain the unexplainable using science, and then they run into the problem that they've just violated science and they can't explain why it happened. Mm, mm. Yeah, I totally agree. So, there's nothing wrong with speaking philosophically. There's nothing wrong with believing that there's this deeper level of consciousness that that rises above the level of space and time. I don't have I don't have a problem with those kinds of conversations at all. Um, in fact, they they do make a lot of sense to me. But you have to have them in the correct context by saying that I recognize now I'm talking philosophically. This is not a you know scientific method conversation anymore. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. That's it's a conversation with a, with a bunch of sociologists. I was. Um, paid to give a series of lectures to the sociology department in the university about publishing papers in in uh, in in the english speaking press and one of the things i talked about was i talked about the scientific method these were social scientists of course and was explaining to them what the scientific method was and one particular person became extremely irate that I could possibly think there was only one scientific method, but in fact there were many scientific methods. <laughs> and uh, and and uh, and uh, and w wanted to say that whatever they were doing was was equally good science to whatever I thought I might be doing in terms of being able to go around the loop of testing things against experiment. But I think that that there is a philosophy of science, and I think that. Science is becoming too compartmentalized. You get people who don't understand each other's fields, who are working within a bubble, within a field. And one example of this is quantum computing, for example, where, uh, the, the, where we have Alice and Bob, and you have this idea that Alice and Bob um, can do things to modify the environment for what a photon sees, when, of course, they can't. So you end up with having, they can't because the photon is something which collapses space-time to a single point. So there's no way to come between that. If you have a system which is mediated by photons, then that system sees the whole of its environment at the same point in space and time. And but people start by saying, if this happens, and then Alice does this, but Alice doesn't have any time to do this. Mm. There is no time. So so you have things which which are philosophical, but are philosophically based, but they're based on a on, on a series of axioms, which one's made up, and one needs to say that that's the case. Mm. Right, so right. It has it, been made up on that set of axioms. It seems to me that a huge, a huge olive branch here would be to 
divide those fields in a way that they were given respect so that the philosophers of science, the people who are working on these interpretive levels, didn't feel like you were stealing their robes, essentially, by saying they're not doing science. You know, that, that title of science has supremacy in the academic world, and there's a deep threat to the legitimacy of people working on those ideas if they're not considered scientists, or if there's not an alternative category that has the same level of prestige. I think we almost have the, the reverse problem at the moment. You have a lot of people who are doing big science, who are spending an awful lot of money doing that science, who are actually promulgating something that isn't subject to the scientific method. I'm thinking about CERN in this case. Mm -hmm. so, so then you have people saying, we are the scientists, we are the ones who are going to solve the problems of the universe. Of course, it's completely irrelevant to anything one would actually want to build. But, um, but, um, but, but those robes have been, the robes of the great scientists have been taken over by these people who really are doing quite often parameter fitting, not proper science at all, mm, and, mm. On, which is based on a mathematics, on a science, it's beautiful maths. But why can't that be beautiful maths? Beautiful maths can be beautiful maths. Mm, and maths mm, mm, different robes. See, that's different robes. They need to have their own building. Where... <laughs> I, I think that it's really valuable to keep in mind just how central the role of scientist is in our society and how not central the role of mathematician or philosopher is. Like, those are absolutely... It's almost like the last feudal title or something, right? It's very close to lordship or it's something. Just, it's, it's, very, it's very invested in uh, truth, beauty, uh, the making sense of the world, the, the making of good choices, mm. in a way that mathematics is not, in a way that philosophy is not, because science is the, the, the realm in which the state has decided that this is the mechanism of knowing what is correct and then taking the next step down the line of whatever policy we want to enact. Right, but unfortunately, follow the science has now become a political statement, not a scientific one. And that, and that's an entire that's that's a huge problem, and that's what we're trying to untangle here. But I'm just I, yeah. I always think about this where I'm like, okay, so you can retitle people, and you can maybe start to, to 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 change your definitions, but you'll never get away from the fact that people, for their own desperate desires, wish to change the way that language is used in order to change their position in the world. Like I ran into this in a really weird way the other day, where I was talking to somebody about uh, allergies and babies. And sh this friend of mine mentioned that uh, there was such a thing as a non-IgE-mediated allergy. And I was very surprised by this because I was like, well, allergies are defined by their mediation by IgE. This is one of those, it's an identity property where allergies are those that are mediated by IgE, which is a specific type of antibody. And I started looking into it and I realized that there had been a social movement to redefine hypersensitivities, immune reactions that were not allergies as non-IgE allergies, because to tell someone that your kid has a hypersensitivity is not the same thing as to tell someone that your kid has an allergy. And so there was a campaign to rename hypersensitivities as true allergies, despite the fact that they're not, by virtue of making the lives of parents navigating the world with children with hypersensitivities easier when they go to tell someone, hey, my kid has an allergy to this thing. They don't have to get into the fact that it's different from an IgE-mediated allergy. And so... No, no, those, those, the, the, those things do happen. I had an example of that in one of the referee things that I had for one of my papers. Hmm. I, I had stated right at the beginning of the paper that I was going to use an algebra that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a Dirac algebra that's not complex. And anyway, so there we are. That was near the beginning of the paper. Now, I think this particular referee hadn't really read much of the rest of the paper because his comment was, this cannot be true because Dirac algebras are complex. So, uh, so, so, but the Dirac algebra isn't defined by whether or not it's complex. It's defined by a series of commutation relations and so forth. So he was not correct in that, but that was a redefinition. My kind of Dirac algebra is not the same sort of Dirac algebra as he's using. <laughs> So, uh, so, and it's it is on the basis of words, and we make up the world we live in on the basis of the words which we use to describe it. Yes, 
And this is why these conversations are so important, because the physics, as it lies at the foundation of, of the material world, requires us to be able to talk about what's happening at the foundation of material reality in a way that makes sense. And if we're talking about things in ways that are spooky or nonsensical and moving concepts around rather than bounding things at the appropriate level, we're never going to get to the next stage. And so I guess my question is, we've talked a little bit about the technological implications, but but can you, to close this this very wide-ranging discussion, imagine some of the ways that your work can push the frontiers of technology? This this is something we definitely are working on right now a lot. And if you look at the homepage of Quasicle, you'll notice right at the top, and you probably saw this, is that we believe that the proof of new science is through engineering. So yeah, it's definitely an important aspect of it. And we are we do have a few things in development at the moment that might be a little too soon to talk about in a public forum, but definitely something we could reconvene later, you know, when it's further along. But yeah, there, there definitely are technological and engineering implications of this. It's a very powerful new theory. Like like you said, John, the power of John's subquantum mechanics is that you go deeper than the previously axiomatic, you know, boundary level. It's able to penetrate deeper than that. So that is going to have engineering implications because right now they're engineering with Schrodinger, which is you know, which is not the full picture. It's close, but it's not the full picture. So, but John could probably talk more intelligently about that than I. Mm. Well, that's that's exactly right. I mean, what one has to do is one has to challenge this. You have to challenge the fact that this is that this is not taking place. People are ch- challenging things like this. Some of them doing very well. And Sabine Hossefelder has been doing some great work on 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 you guys doing this. This is the sort of thing that's required. One has to. What's required is to put me in discussion or somebody like me in discussion or somebody like Carver Mead in discussion with some of the string theorists. Put the, put, put the two of us in a room together and have a discussion about that and just see what happens. Because that, 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 that will be... It's... This, this non-science thing, it's, it, it's totally insidious. It is eating people's lives. It's taking the most talented people in the in society and sticking them into something which is fundamentally already wrong just where you start from and things have to be you must not take as is done in the standard theory every single particle as having its own field the up quark field and the down quark field and the strange quark field and then we'll add that you end up with a hamiltonian or a lagrangian for these things which covers an entire page and you don't even know if you've got all the right bits in it you're, you're adding ridiculous complexity to stuff and complexifying the thing for no in, into a theory which can't calculate anything anyway. So, so what is the point of all those wasted lives going into that stuff? This is really has to be challenged. And the only way, well, I, we, we had a discussion a little while ago that uh, there was about, about new ideas having trouble getting out. Um, Martin and I published our paper on electron as a localized photon in 97, but we wrote the first paper in 1991. And in the intervening time, we submitted it, th- I think, three times before the fourth time it was published. Now, I had been very active in the field of solid state physics before that at a high level, and uh, I was invited to a conference organized by Klaus von Klitzing, Nobel Prize 1980, amongst others. And he was shouted me over when uh, when he saw me he said hey john what you know we haven't you've not been we haven't heard anything from you for a year or two what's what's going on and so i said well i'm working on this new theory and told him what it was went went through the stuff and very clever guy and he picked it up pretty well he said this is very important you must give a talk on this um i will arrange you give the closing talk for this conference which i did um that that was all fine but um but i said but klaus you know that p- people are having real tr- this was 1996 this uh, conference people are having real trouble um uh, accepting this, uh, I, I've submitted it. I've submitted it three times. It's been rejected three times by the uh, by the good press. And Klaus laughed and he said, "Ha ha ha! Uh, my paper was rejected four times before they published it." And of course, that was the paper that won him the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1980. 
so 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 it, it is the case that stuff which is new has a higher threshold of respectability because it just does look very very strange so that's one thing we have to work against the other one is this corporatism which has now infected a lot of science um so in short i think the only thing to do is to strongly oppose it and to try and make energetic progress in doing the right thing and doing it properly and then try and and then Darwinian selection will take over. Yeah. Mm-hmm. When it's engineered with successfully, that'll, you know, that'll make enough of a statement that will move things forward. I hope so. I hope so. I mean, this yeah. has been this has been a fascinating discussion. We have a lot to think about. We have a lot more discussions to more have. More people to talk to. More people to talk to. Mm-hmm. Um, it's kind of... I don't think that there's an end to it, right? Because these are questions that are... As as you start to resolve one, there are many others that you suddenly start to get keys to, and so it's it's a reequilibration of science from the smallest possible objects and behaviors to the largest ones, right? Because I don't I don't think that you can leave any of these foundations untouched. If you start to question the nature of light, then you start to quas- question. Then you start to question the CMB. And if you start to question the CMB, you start to question the Big Bang. If you start to question the Big Bang, you start to question the foundations of what people go on talk shows to say that science can wield. And that is a reckoning that is going to be very, very difficult. And it's our task to 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 guide people through it, I think, because there's this, such a strong immune system where scientists want to get into a room, just start screaming at each other about how the other person is wrong. They want to throw hot coffee. They want to punch each other. And that's just, that's not going to help anyone. I think that the key is to be able to help people change their minds without a loss to reputation. Mm-hmm. Because what is fundamentally important is that the data that's collected at CERN is important for actually being able to evaluate what's happening. The data that is collected and the collaborations that have led to these projects are valuable and important and good. It's just what's built on top of them that needs to change, and that can be a collaborative project. Well, I think sometimes even the data collection is contaminated by the preconceived <laughs> notions. I mean, there was, a, there was actually... Um, I mean, there was there were there was it was written up in the Australian press some time ago. There's many examples of this, but the Australian Meteorology Society they had a cutoff for temperatures that they could record in their data. Like if it was colder than a certain temperature, you weren't allowed to record the data because that didn't then you know it may it risked undermining their the particular model for climate that they had at the time. Oh my goodness. So they wouldn't record, you know. So like those are those are the kind of things that are very insidious. In science, you know, it's very hard to be objective when our human nature is getting in the way with it, with any kind of, you know, vested interest of any kind. It contaminates our science in the hardest way to see in oneself. <laughs> there's, there's another example I had, which was um, we published a paper which we, we, we had intended to have a look at quantum transport in semiconductors, and we did. We did things using this quantum point contact spectrometer, which I developed, and we saw electron focusing peaks, so electrons were going bouncing along an edge and bouncing into a second quantum point contact that showed substructure. And we thought, ah, it's quantum substructure. So we published a paper on that, which was fine. And uh, myself and Carlo Bennett did some calculations on this stuff, and uh, and uh, the substructure could indeed be um, looked at as a form of quantum interference. Anyway, later I began to understand a bit more about quantum interference and realized that independent fermions shouldn't really interfere with themselves and then i also had a phd student who did some simulations for me and i had a look at what the effects was of making the boundary not quite smooth but a bit rough and it turned out that gave exactly the same sort of structure in other words it wasn't a quantum effect at all it was actually just a slightly imperfect device anyway i then tried to publish this and I got it rejected on the grounds that Williamson et al. or my group had already shown that this was quantum interference. <laughs> so, 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 what? So, 
it can be difficult. There, there can be things which, are, which, are, which, which happen in science which don't get out into the public domain because they're not getting through a filter of respectability in terms of the level at which they're published at. And there's quite mm. a, there are quite a few examples of that, have been quite a few examples of that. I mean, there's Klaus von Klitzing's paper on the quantum hall effect. That was one of them. But there's also the work of Halton Arp. There's also the work in the polarized proton scattering of Krish and his group, who found it in 1977, disproving the quark model, nota bene, that still hasn't been resolved. These things are not being taken forward because it's not because it's thought in some way to harm the reputation of mm. science. But it's not science's reputation. It's not. It's doing really not science in order to do that. Yeah, it's, harming the, it's harming the reputation of individuals, not of science. That's the problem. Mm. Well, I guess we can be thankful that uh, no one's getting burned at the stake anymore. So, you know, Bruno suffered worse than us. And, uh, you know, maybe yeah. there is some hope for progress, at least in that tiny little fact. Um, absolutely. That's at least something. Well, lady, lady and gentlemen, I think we've had a very good session now over the last nearly three hours now. Absolutely. But what, what I'd suggest is that if you have a look at our website, and especially the talk that Arnie just gave, and certainly the, uh, I think that, and Arnie also has a, um, another t talk up, um, which is kind of an introduction to Quisical as, as a whole. I'd recommend going into those and having a look because that gives an overview. Of what the whole and I would just encourage you also to look at the John's last talk, which is titled Absolute Relativity Theory as a Proposed Solution to Hilbert Sixth, where John actually gives a two and a half to three hour talk going through his entire theory from beginning to end, which is the tour de force and definitely, you know, worth watching. So mine's kind of more like a an overview with a couple of, you know, ideas about what it might portend, and then John's is like a full background. So Perfect. Thanks. Yeah, we'll we'll link them for people to find them in the description too. Mm -hmm. But yeah, thank you both for coming by. It's been wonderful. I, I look forward to more subsequent discussions, uh, hopefully both with you and with your colleagues. And uh, yeah, thank us. you. Yeah, it's wonderful.